Hello there, welcome to the Saray channel and welcome to my Omnibus series. I've got so many of these Omnibuses that are going to come out so that you'll be able to listen to an hour's worth of stories which I know you're going to love. You know, the thing is that telling stories is such a fine art and it's something that was practiced hundreds of years ago when people didn't have the technology that we have today. And everyone would gather around the fire and listen to a wonderful story. And also, what is so wonderful about a story is that, personally, I think it is the best way to go to sleep. Every night when I go to bed, I always listen to stories. And that's something that parents used to do with their children. It's something that they still do with their children. There's nothing better than a good story. And so I hope you're going to enjoy this series. And before we start, I just want to say, do subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss out on anything because I'm in for the long haul and I want to make sure that you get the most stunning stories to go to bed with at night or to listen to when you want to be one of those people sitting beside the fire and listening. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and let's get started. I hope you're going to enjoy the Omnibus. Dear Sarah, and all your lovely listeners, what the hell was I doing here, I wondered, glancing around at my immediate environment, which was both unfamiliar and strange to me. It was almost as if I was caught up in an illusional dream. No, this was definitely a fictitious dream. It had to be, I assured myself. It didn't matter that it felt profoundly real, nor did it matter that I could smell the obtrusive cloying scent of the heart-shaped plastic air freshener hanging from the visor mirror in my explorer, that was swinging backwards and forwards like a pendulum. The artificial scent I loathed. My wife insisted it made my car smell delightfully fresh, of synthetic apples. You need to make your car smell nice at times, she said, failing to appreciate that I never liked the smell of anything fake, any more than the god-awful cheap perfume she always wore, that I couldn't stand. What did she call it? Lily of the Valley that had been clearly made in a laboratory where nothing close to nature was used in the vile synthetic concoction. I'd never had the heart to tell her I couldn't stand that hideously repugnant smell. I'd bought her an expensive perfume to wear instead. Chanel Number no. 5, I believe it was. But she refused to wear it every day. No, it was only for special occasions. Sometimes a man cannot win, even when he employs the utmost tact in his approach. If my wife had asked me, for example, if her bum looked big in something she was wearing, I was the kind of husband that would say, No, no, absolutely not. Besides, the more there is of you, the more there is to love. For I'd rather tell a bare-faced lie than cause any kind of offence to my wife. I couldn't bear to upset her. I guess I picked up the rather skilled, discreet art of telling white lies from a very diplomatic father who always told my mother exactly what she wanted to hear. It was so much easier that way. Of course she hadn't burnt the black pot roast that tasted disgustingly of charcoal to a cinder, which ominously resembled the bottom of a worn-out rubber boot. My father would tell her that the black hard rock on his plate was both tender and delicious. He would give her a warm, appreciative smile. Oh, you are so kind, she'd say. I think it may be just a wee bit tough. Don't be ridiculous, he would say. It's absolutely delicious. My mother would look heartily relieved. My very genteel father would stealthily stuff the black pieces of meat in a plastic bag. He always kept in his jacket for such purposes, to toss out later, very discreetly in the dumpster, when my mother was not looking. And sneakily he'd make himself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, which he would eat privately in his office. Of course she looked wonderful in her wide-brimmed hat that she was wearing to the horse races that had more plastic fruit on it than you found in our fruit bowl on the kitchen table where the fruit actually belonged. The plastic fruit had looked both vulgar and gaudy on a hat but my mother thought it was a work of art and my father would not tell her any different. Of course the dress she'd brought three sizes too small for her looked both classy, sophisticated and flattering on her it showed off her rather square-looking physique to perfection, when in reality she looked like an older woman, 
trying to pretend to be a teenager. The quintessential mutton dressed up as lamb, so to speak. Or, if I'm being rudely blunt, like a stuffed sausage. Would my father tell my mother the truth? Absolutely not. And likewise, I appeared to be heading down a similar path, with white lies becoming a useful benign currency, in order to keep the peace in my relationship. When I was younger, I swore to myself that I was going to be brutally honest with my wife, but after getting my fingers burnt in that approach more times than I care to mention, sometimes our best intentions can be flung to the wayside, like an old apple core on the side of the road. As I sat there in my explorer, the lingering dream I was presently engaged in seemed to become profoundly real, employing all of my senses of both smell, touch, sight and sound, which was more than a little bizarre to say the very least, but also pleasingly enjoyable. When had I experienced a dream before, where I could even feel the comfortable cushioning of the leather buttressing me up against the substantial padding of the front seat of my car? I could feel the ribbon of the safety belt pinning me to the seat. When I glanced down at myself, I became conspicuously aware that I was wearing my velvety blue slippers on my feet and a pair of blue and white striped pyjamas on my body. Why was I wearing my pyjamas in the car that was parked in the middle of a sequestered country road? What on earth was I doing here? And where exactly was I? This was a pretty incongruous experience for me. But then again, dreams never do make sense, do they? In the morning, I would be lightly telling my wife over the breakfast table all the details of my idiosyncratic dream, if I could remember them, of course. More often than not, I predictably forgot my dreams. But surely I would remember this unusually vivid dream, with its remarkable exacting attention to detail. I felt rather chilly in the car, aware that I hadn't even bothered to wear my velvety blue dressing gown and it wasn't exactly warm. The temperatures of late after a viciously unforgiving summer had dipped significantly, and the drop in temperature had announced that winter was on the cusp of making its formidable presence known. In this curiously rather outlandish dream of mine, I could feel the wisps of cold air impertinently pierce through the cotton of my pyjamas, like a witch's icy fingers. I shivered, briefly glancing up at my reflection in the visor mirror. I was a sight for sore eyes. I certainly had looked better before. One side of my sandy brown hair was flattened. There were creases in my skin, where I'd pressed my face against the pillows of my bed so hard that I'd left those prominent railway-like tracks on my face. I glanced down at the carpeted floor of my car, which was covered in a plethora of gold and red crisp autumn leaves that had lightly been brought in after sticking to the bottom of my boots that I wore every day on the job. "'travelling from one farm to another to inspect their livestock, "'which could be a messy job. "'It was a difficult challenge when the capriciously fickle weather "'was both wet and muddy, not to bring the outside in, "'something which my wife professed many grievances over, "'claiming that I carried more mud on me than the wheels on a farmer's tractor, "'and that her pristine cream living-room carpets "'looked like they belonged in a pig's pen.' Wow, this dream was certainly impressive, in its graphic recall and colourful splashes, where all the ambiguous uncertainty was wiped away like the chalk on a teacher's blackboard. I was experiencing a befuddling, enigmatic movie of the mind, where all my senses from smell and touch were fully engaged. The generous peppering of silvery moonlight from a pearly moon floated through the windows of my car, and I noticed that the blazing intrusive lights of my car headlights shone like a bright beacon. It was a pushy, invasive, pronounced illumination, like that of a lighthouse lighting up a vast strip of ocean, so that the ships out at sea could find their way safely to shore on a windy night. Only this indiscreet light lit up the long ribbon of white dust rather than the ocean. My car was parked in the middle of this remote dusty road that was as unfamiliar and foreign to me as the skin on my own back. What the hell was I doing here? And why was I even here? Even in my floating, surreal, dreamlike state, I could make absolutely no sense of this inexplicable, impenetrable mystery. I had no knowledge of knowing where I was. This perplexing, befuddling world between worlds was profoundly lucid, but as I battled and struggled to pull back the ambiguous, foggy curtain 
to see a little better by opening my eyes. I realised to my astonishment that they were open already, and that what I was seeing and perceiving was not the spurious ramblings of an ethereal hallucination, but I was confronting something that was in fact tangibly real. I was not lying in my comfortable king-size bed at home, as I presumed I was, with my gentle snoring wife swaddled in the cocoon of her sheets next to me, where she'd wake up every morning in a tangled mess. Let's just say, most of the time, the sheets had been audaciously snatched away from me during the night, which usually meant when the weather dipped, I'd wake up freezing cold like a bear with a sore head, because I would be mad with her for being so cold. As I sat there in my explorer, my eyes widened incredulously, my lashes twitched, and my jaw began to clench tightly, and even the balls of my Adam's apple jiggled in amusement. I realised in profound horror that this was no dream. I was genuinely parked in an unfamiliar road, in the middle of nowhere, at the dead of night, not knowing how I'd even ended up here, or where I was. It was an airy, inauspicious, haunting feeling. It didn't help that the clock on my dashboard registered two o'clock in the morning. I drew in a deep breath to steady my nerves, as I could feel my indignant heart beginning to friskily pound against the wall of my chest. Was I not supposed to be safely tucked up in my sumptuously cosy bed, with my devoted wife lying at my side, in our comfortable Kentucky home in the bluegrass state? So how the hell did I get out here? when I had no memory of even driving to this obscure, remote, rather desolate-looking country road that I didn't even recognise, not even remotely. Believe me, I had travelled many of these back roads in the past before, as shortcuts to get to my destinations quickly and efficiently, to avoid the pitfalls of uncongenial traffic congestion, but this place had no recall in my memory. If I'd left my bedroom in the middle of the night and sauntered off to the garage to take a ride in my explorer, would my wife not have been roused from her tranquilized slumber and been quickly alerted to my strange behavior? I'm assuming I'd have made some kind of noise. I wasn't exactly nimble on my feet, and my wife was tirelessly complaining that I sounded like a herd of bison when I scrambled up and down our staircase during the night if I needed to take a trip to the kitchen to get something to drink. George, must you make such a god-awful commotion? She'd grumble. When you get out of bed, the whole bedroom shakes like an earthquake. How am I ever expected to get a wink of sleep? Why are you so damned ungainly on your feet? You sound like a herd of elephants. Surely on this night, if I'd staggered out of the house in a sleep-induced while, she'd have heard my blundering commotion, and at the very least wondered what I was doing. My wife did not suffer fools gladly. She was a very light sleeper, and would not have been adverse to waking me up, if she remotely suspected I was sleepwalking, by throwing a bucket of ice-cold water on my face. She'd have lightly snapped at me curtly and said, "'George, for God's sake, you've been walking in your sleep! What is wrong with you?' Regretfully, my wife lacked any subtle tact, and could be brazenly cutting with her words if needs must. She'd have not tolerated me walking in my sleep." which is clearly what I must have done tonight, for there was no other explanation as to why I found myself here. Worse still, I had driven here in my sleep, with no recollection of the event. I was trying to process the oddity of my current situation, like figuring out which piece of a jigsaw puzzle fit where. I found myself becoming more confused and disorientated. It occurred to me that maybe for the first time in my life I had indeed sleepwalked, but the question was why, and what had triggered this outlandish behaviour on my part. By all accounts I had driven myself to this strange remote location in the middle of the night, but I had no memory of even leaving my bed, my home, or even driving my car. Surely I would remember that. Was I suffering from some kind of bizarre amnesia? I glanced down at the keys that were dangling from the ignition, affirming to me that I must have driven here on my own accord without even being consciously aware of it. The thought made me shiver in horror. Of course I knew the perilous dangers and brutally cruel ramifications of driving under the influences of both drugs and alcohol that can so easily invite horrifying consequences to cross your path 
and steal away the bright promises of a rosy future, like a blood-sucking leech that has no empathy for your plight whatsoever. Obstensively, once the script has been written and laid out, it can never ever be erased. I had not drunk anything on this night, and no drugs or alcohol had crossed the threshold of my throat, but I had been out cold, almost as if caught up in a black fog. I had driven here tonight in the blindness of my lack of consciousness. Anything could have happened. I could have obliviously run over a pedestrian, or severely injured, harmed, or even killed a human or an animal, and such sobering grim prospects turned my blood icy cold, and my guts as rancid and putrid as baked beans or milk on the turn. In truth, harming another was unlikely at this time of the night, but there was the distinct possibility I could have done severe harm to myself, and nonchalantly driven into a tree, and been obliviously unaware of my own actions. I knew I would never drive anywhere in slippers or pyjamas. For a start, my slippers certainly did not give me purchase on the brakes. Furthermore, it's very embarrassing for a mature man like myself to be caught wearing my pyjamas when I'm out driving. To be fair, I have seen a few women shopping at Walmart in their pyjamas during the late afternoon with a bold confidence that I always secretly admire. I like people who don't give a damn what others think. They don't care if people are pointing and sniggering on their behalf or saying all kinds of rude things about them. We should all be like that. For me personally, I couldn't do it. Although I dare say it's got to be rather comfortable sauntering around the place in your pyjamas. But wearing slippers can be precariously tricky, especially if you're operating heavy machinery, driving a car, or walking over tracks of wilderness, with footwear that is more likely to be hazardous rather than helpful. It was really tough having to assimilate the perturbing, indigestible thought that I had driven here to this remote location in my sleep, which was as hard to swallow as a golf ball being stuck at the back of my throat. Did people ever drive in their sleep, I wondered. I'd never heard of it before. As far as I knew, I'd never suffered from the condition of sleepwalking. If it had been an issue in my childhood, my parents would have made me aware of the problem, and likely done their damnedest to address its underlying causes. Maybe tonight's absurd activities had been brought on by stress. Was I worrying about anything in particular at the moment? Not really. I couldn't think of anything. Yesterday, as a vet, I had lanced a couple of large masses on Farmer Pearson's steers. Two of them had huge masses, filled with pus. They were abscesses. They felt immeasurable relief when they were drained. And lying aside my rubber boots was a large puddle of pus and blood. Farmer Pearson had been so relieved, fearing that the masses were cancerous, as usually that would mean the end of the steer. Suffice to say, I had done my routine treatments and vaccinations and checkups on horses, cows and steers. And as always, a few conditions needed my attention to treat when attending to a large herd, which was always the way, but never ever stressful. Nothing had bludgeoned itself rudely into my life. So why the hell had I been sleepwalking? And what was I doing in the middle of a country road like this that I did not recognise? As I sat there in my car, staring ahead of me, at the night, in a bemused kind of trance, I began to assimilate my environment, as if watching it through the lens of a telescope for the very first time. The rather uneven road I was on was strewn with rocks and pebbles, for it had never been asphalted, which suggested it was not ever rarely used. You would have thought the bumpy jolts on this road would have bounced me precariously out of my sleep, but not so. But then again a rocking motion can be oddly calming. My mother had always rocked me to sleep when I was a baby boy. The dirt road I was parked on was liberally fringed on either side by small tracks of rocky grassy ground, where about fifty feet from the road were large congregations of maple and oak trees, their tall, dark, lofty silhouettes, all but a dense tenebrific blur on the horizon. I was in no doubt that during the day they would look absolutely spectacular at this time of the year as the Kentucky countryside had become an artist's dream of late, with a plethora of golds, ambers and reds confiscating the landscape under a canvas of bewitching dreamy colours that had almost made autumn my quintessential favourite time of the year. Even if the cold breath of winter was rudely breathing down my neck, reminding me that she was on her way, 
It certainly felt nippy now, I thought, as I shivered in my truck, reaching for the torch in the dashboard. I'd noticed some big black blob lying in the middle of the road, a short way ahead of me. Maybe that was why I'd stopped the car in my sleep. It certainly looked like a large dead animal of some kind, lying in the road, blocking my path, but I could not be sure. I wanted to find out exactly what it was. I could, of course, drive towards it, but the thought never actually crossed my mind. I began to fiddle with the switch on my torch, relieved to see that it had a good illumination and plenty of battery life. Good, I thought. That was at least a promising start. Could I dare to hope my cell phone was in the car, for I might get a GPS signal to give me an idea of whereabouts I was, but as I expected, I didn't have it with me. It was probably charging on the oakwood dresser at home, where I put it in the evening before I retired to bed. I climbed out of the car rather reluctantly, slamming the door behind me, flicking my torch over the road. I steadily moved towards the big black blob in the middle of the road. My first thought was that I was staring at a piece of roadkill, an animal that had been run over. I leaned over the huge mound of hair and poked it with a stick, but there was no response. But as I studied the form more closely, I discovered I was studying a bear pelt, lying in the middle of the road. It smelt manky, musty and disgusting, and I threw it to the side in disgust. I was about to return to my car, when I saw a flashing light coming from the trees. What the hell was that? It looked like an alarm signal of some kind. I could not make out what it was, but when me and my brother were kids, we loved to do SOS signals with a torch from opposite rooms in our house by way of communication, where we would use the signal to announce that the coast was clear and Mum and Dad were safely tucked in bed. This signal reminded me of that. Was someone in trouble? Is that why they were giving me an SOS signal? Maybe someone had accidentally taken a nasty tumble and was signalling to me for help. It would be remiss of me to ignore such a signal. I glanced down at my slippers, grimacing at the prospect of tackling a walk in the woods at the dead of night in this flimsy excuse for footwear. This certainly was not my idea of fun. I wore the kind of slippers that would often randomly slide off my feet. They had been a gift from my wife one Christmas, and I'd never enjoyed wearing them, especially now. Call me old-fashioned, but I preferred to wear footwear that gave me some kind of cushioning. I would have liked to have ignored the flashing lights, but they persisted, and how could I live with myself if I just callously, insouciantly walked away? I could see the headlines in the local newspaper the following day saying, Old woman fell off her ATV and was stranded in woods for several days, unable to move due to very bad fractured femur. She was found lying dead due to exposure. I mean, how could I live with myself knowing that I'd seen those flashes of light coming from the trees from the woman's torch she likely had hanging on her keychain or something? Everyone knew three fast flashes and then three slow ones is a traditional SOS signal. And that is exactly what I was seeing. There was no doubt. I couldn't just walk away from that, could I? Nor could I phone the emergency services without a cell phone, to tell them what I'd seen. I speedily stepped up my pace, and as I suspected, my foot kept slipping and sliding out of the damn slippers I was wearing, but somehow I managed to navigate my way through a tumble of grass mingled with earthen soil and jagged rocks that protruded out of the ground like a shark's teeth, until I entered the lofty congregation of trees, where the gnarled knotty roots plundered through the soil like a tangle of sailors' knots that could so easily trip me up if I wasn't particularly careful. It was soberingly dark in the woods, so much so that I physically shrank away from entering them, but I knew that my reservations could not be gainfully employed if I needed to help someone in trouble. I had no choice but to abandon my reluctance and stoically move towards the flashing lights that were guiding me through the trees. My torchlight enabled me to see my way clearly down the earthen paths that were relatively narrow so my pyjamas were rudely scratched by bushy briars and branches that seemed to reach out to snag the cotton. The towering trees, with their generous outstretched arms, shook their boughs and their leaves rustled in the wind, while some leaves were picked up by the breeze and they danced before me like a confetti of celestial butterflies. My slippers were giving me no end of trouble, becoming increasingly frustrating, for they gave me no purchase on the ground beneath me.
and I kept slipping all over the place. I knew that after this intrepid adventure in the woods, their next destination would be the dumpster, without apology. I was cursing under my breath. Damn these bloody slippers! Damn them! Finally I called out through the trees. The echo of my voice seemed to bounce back at me like a tennis ball. Is anyone there? Hello? Hello? Does anybody need help? Does anybody need my help? Hello? Hello? I tried to search for the lights that I'd seen, but I saw nothing. Where had they gone? For a moment I flashed my torchlight through the trees, but saw absolutely nothing. But that was when I heard whistles. It sounded as if one whistle was coming from one direction, another from another direction, and another from yet another direction, as if the whistles were some kind of interactive communication. But from whom or what, I didn't know. I don't mind admitting it freaked me the hell out. I was reminded of one of the farms I regularly visited. The farmer's name was Angus Buchanan. He swore to me his woods were haunted. He had said, pointing a crooked finger at the woods, I've seen things, heard strange whistles there, lots of whistling, seen dark ominous shadows, heard disembodied shrieks, seen flashing lights. He had told me this in a haunted voice. I remember I was examining his cows at the time, discussing the treatment protocol of a cow who was getting rather thin. And when he told me all the stuff, in truth I tried to suppress a grin. I mean, I didn't believe in things that go bump in the night, ghosts or ghoulies or monsters said to haunt the woods of the bluegrass state, where legends have abounded over the centuries, but I've never given them any credence. Well, not until now, that is. The eccentric old farmer clearly believed in all kinds of hocus-pocus stuff and nonsense, and at the time I had humoured him with a light, scant laugh and said, I wouldn't take those legends seriously, Farmer Buchanan. The old farmer had shaken his head and said, You really have no idea, do you? You probably think I'm a silly old man who's lost my marbles. But believe me, I've seen things in those woods, George. Things that I dare not repeat, because you'd only laugh at me. A shiver of dread ran down my spine. Right now, in this inauspicious, dark, bodeful place, where tenebrific shadows danced treacherously through the trees, I could have believed anything was possible. And now the ancient legends spoken about by our great-grandfathers did not seem so far-fetched and implausible. For a second I got the profound sense that there were menaciously evil eyes with guileful intent, clandestinely watching me, and there were many of them. But when I flashed my torch over the branches of the trees, I saw nothing. It was amazing what you could envisage when you were enveloped between the lofty trees of a sprawling woodgrove in the dead of night, when your mind is taunted and teased by the power of suggestion. Suffice to say, if anyone lacks imagination, I thought pensively to myself, bring them out here in the dead of night, park them there in the tangled shadows of this foreboding inhospitable forest, and in no time at all they'll start to dream up dreadfully titanic demonical creatures that don't even exist in our reality. I knew I would. In a trice I was gripped by an inexplicable, incredulous fear that seized me as suddenly as if someone had hit me across the cheeks with a cold bare hand. I could bear it no longer, as fear gripped me so powerfully that I bolted through the trees, being slowed down by the awkward tread of my slippers that failed to gain much purchase, and on several rather harrowing occasions I very nearly lost my footing, when a gnarled root reached out to grab my foot. Run! 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 Every part of my mind was screaming out at me. For God's sake, run, George! There's something in the woods. It's going to get you. Run! Run! I am sorry, but if there was an old woman in those trees who had unfortunately fallen off her ATV and had been desperately signalling for help, too bloody bad. I was not going into that grove of trees again, not if you paid me a million dollars or more. It was airy in there, spooky, and I was certainly being watched by something, with no evidence to prove that my fictitious impressions were remotely true. But I was in no doubt that something or someone had been watching me. I might not have seen a thing, but I had felt those eyes burrowing into the back of my skull, studying me with a predatory intent. I knew I had not imagined that feeling, and never in my life had I experienced the adrenal response that a rabbit might get when being chased by a fox. 
It's not an experience I would care to repeat, when every single cell of your body can taste death on the wind, as if its dark shadow is only a hair's breadth away from getting you. I was breathing furiously fast by the time I reached my car. My rapid breathing and pounding heart had nothing to do with my being unfit. It was because I was terrified out of my skin, and my skin was crawling as if hundreds of tarantulas were running up and down my back. I glanced briefly over my shoulders, afraid that I'd see a monstrous beast bounding towards me from the trees, but nothing had given me chase. Was I going completely mad? I was still very certain that I was being watched. I speedily made haste, in my rather ungainly, cumbersome gestures, that in my heightened sense of distress became infinitely more clumsy and uncoordinated. I needed to get the hell out of here, and out of here fast. My focus became almost tunnel-visioned. I staggered to my car awkwardly, like an inebriated drunk. For indeed, had anyone been watching me, they would likely think I was completely blundered, when nothing of the kind was remotely true. But when you're affrighted, the signals from your brain that send messages to your muscles don't function so fluidly. For a moment my trembling hands rattled as I flung open the driver's side door. With a measure of relief, mingled with trepidation, I sank gratefully into the comfortable leather seat of my explorer, and with fingers that had become like arthritic, non-compliant appendages, it took me a few rather cumbersome attempts to start up the engine. Damn! Damn! I kept mumbling. Damn! Finally my explorer sprang into life, as if it had been rudely awoken from a comfortable slumber, and was now contemptuously growling at me. Even though I did not know where the hell I was, I was sure that if I followed the road, I would eventually reach an area that looked rather familiar. As my hardened rubber tyres, used to driving in perilous condition, grazed the rather craggy road with an accelerated swaggering jolt, I managed to drive away steadily down the road. With the pinging sounds of stones beating against the car's underbelly, I could smell the manky smell I'd first encountered when I had approached the beer pelt in the middle of the road that I had tossed to one side. I had not even touched the thing, not properly, but for some bizarre reason. I had brought the smell with me in the car. It must have somehow contaminated my clothes. I was pondering over the smell that failed to be obliterated by the synthetic stench of apple from the air freshener, when all of a sudden I heard a groan, and this time I nearly jumped out of my skin. I stopped the car with a jolt, and nearly had a heart attack on the spot, when I looked over my shoulders towards the back seat, where the stench was incredibly strong. I discovered to my abject horror of the manky-looking bear pelt that I had seen lying in the middle of the road, was now on my back seat. What the hell was it doing there? I reminded myself that when I'd run into the woods after those strange flashing lights I'd believed were an SOS signal, I'd left the doors of my truck unlocked. Had someone put the bear pelt in the back of my explorer as some kind of insidious macabre joke? I wondered for a moment if a couple of teenagers had spotted my car in the middle of the road and decided to recklessly toy with me. Teenagers could be brutally unkind. I knew that from personal experience. Maybe they had spotted my truck on the road and thought it would be a hoot to scare the bejesus out of me with those flashing lights I'd seen in the woods and stuffed the rancid old bear pelt on the back seat of my truck. It would have been funny if I wasn't so annoyed. When I was a teenager, I'd have happily played a joke on someone like this. I remember when I was 16 years old and went to stay in Florida with my cousin. We both put a small crocodile in my mother's bathtub. Oh my God, the screams from my mother made me seize up with laughter, and the horror on her face was priceless. My mother had no experience with crocodiles whatsoever, so she was freaking the hell out. First things first, I thought. I needed to get rid of this ghastly smelling bear pelt off the back seat in my truck. I could barely breathe. The smell of ammonia was intolerable. I'd toss it to the side of the road. It was now burning the back of my throat and causing my eyes to water. If you didn't know any better, you'd think I'd been crying over a very sad movie. I parked my car on the side of the road, and reluctantly climbed out of my truck. Close up, the smell of that bear pelt was atrocious. Damn teenagers, I muttered to myself under my breath. Damn teenagers. I looked on the side of the road for a stick to pick up the bear pelt with. I didn't want to use my hands. 
That was when I heard the cry. What the hell, I thought, taking a step backwards. There was something under the bear pelt. That was when I saw a dark, bashful face peering at me from under the pelt. It had dark, soulful eyes and appeared rather apprehensive. I gasped. It was a baby Bigfoot, probably equivalent to a four-year-old toddler, sitting on the back seat, hiding under the pelt, using it as a blanket. The creature looked at me curiously while I just stared at her. That was when she pointed to her foot, which was swollen to the size of a balloon. I realized she was reaching out to me for help. As a vet, my instincts were immediate. I leaned down to inspect the injured foot with my torch, and then the veterinary surgeon in me took over. I knew this little Bigfoot needed treatment at once. The foot was badly infected. The Bigfoot was sweating profusely. She had a high temperature, and the bruised foot had almost turned blue. If she wasn't careful, she could go into septic shock. The Bigfoot allowed me to examine her foot fully, but winced in pain when I touched the inflamed area. I think you've got a foreign body in there, I told her. I need to take you back to my surgery, or you'll get very sick indeed. The little Bigfoot stared at me, but I could swear she understood every word I was saying. She clutched the pelt tightly to her body like a blanket. I didn't ask myself how an injured, sick Bigfoot got to be in the back of my truck. But she wouldn't be there for very much longer if I didn't attend to her needs at once. The question was, I needed to find my way back home. It was quite extraordinary, because even though I had no idea where I was going, every left or right-hand turn made in the road led me straight back to my property. Before long, I was finally driving down my drive, parking my explorer outside my private veterinary practice, where I'd often rehabilitate wild animals that people brought to me. The only patients I had at the moment were two magpies, who were recovering in their cages from wing injuries, and they were doing superbly, and were very playful. I even had dogs and cat toys, some sparkling things in their large cage that they were playing with inquisitively. I had grown fond of them. I often let them hop around in the back yard. They had grown to trust me, and I was almost sorrowful that sooner or later I'd be returning them to the wild. I opened the back door of my truck, the cute but bashful Bigfoot allowed me to carry her in my arms. She was too sick to protest, and as light as your average toddler, but was well enough to get grievously upset and offended when I promptly disregarded the smelly pelt, tossing it with a measure of disgust in the middle of my driveway. I had clandestinely decided I would secretly dispose of it in the morning, as that ghastly thing had soaked up a lot of ammonia and ponged to high heaven for some reason and it was not coming anywhere near my surgery. She indicated that she wanted the bear pelt, and seemed attached to it like a kid might be attached to her teddy bear. I could tell the little Bigfoot was frightened and rather intimidated to be in a strange place, which was perfectly understandable in the circumstances. I assured her with soothing words that everything would be fine, and that with swift treatment and intravenous fluids and antibiotics, she'd be as right as rain. The poor thing was away from its mother. I can't imagine what it was feeling. It was only two foot tall. I placed the Bigfoot on a bed and gave her a blanket which she seemed to like. The two magpies at the cage at the end of the room were watching her with a curious interest. I don't think she even noticed them. Even in a grip of a high fever, the Bigfoot marvelled how soft the blanket I had given her was and appeared to be captivated by its green colour. I was heartily relieved that I had found a perfect replacement for the smelly pelt. I attached the Bigfoot to an intravenous drip and began to treat her with antibiotics. I was able to lance the Bigfoot's foot successfully, removing a large splinter. I also removed a huge mound of pus and blood from her foot. She was heartily relieved by the comfort it brought her. The other side of her foot was badly infected. I couldn't touch it without her shrieking in pain. I attended to her foot adopting all the protocols needed for her condition. I gave her some sedatives and allowed her to sleep, and then I returned to the house, feeling more than a little frazzled. This had been quite some night, one I would be unlikely to ever forget in a hurry. I didn't have the heart or the energy to confess to my wife that I had been sleepwalking that night. I was hopeful she was still fast asleep, so she wouldn't ask me any awkward questions. How could I explain to her? that I had taken a drive in my sleep and had no memory of the event.
As I entered my house very discreetly, I closed the door carefully behind me, getting the shock of my life when I was met by my cantankerous wife, who looked belligerently angry. I thought she was literally going to blow the roof of the house off. This was all I needed right now, an interrogation by the special forces. She studied me through suspicious narrowing eyes. You've got some explaining to do, George. Where the hell have you been? I woke up at about half past two in the morning and discovered not only were you not in your bed next to me, but your car was missing from the garage. I mean, what am I supposed to think when you go waltzing off in the middle of the night like this with no explanation whatsoever? Now, don't you dare try and pull a farce on me and say it was an emergency call-out. I've been checking your cell phone and you've got no emergency call-outs. I want to know what the hell you think you were doing. I went back to bed and woke up to see your truck parked outside the surgery. What were you doing in there with the lights on? She asked me with her brows raised. I was not about to tell my wife about my sleepwalking or the Bigfoot I'd encountered. I believe the little Bigfoot deserved to be treated privately, without any interference, and at the best of times my wife could be a busybody, but she barely ever crossed the threshold of my private surgery, thank goodness. I'm listening, George. This better be good, or I'm tossing you in the doghouse, she said, giving me a huge frown, with hands on her hips. She looked quite sweet, with a pugnacious expression on her face, and her tousled hair hanging in indignant buoyant curls on her shoulders. On sensing my amusement, my wife looked even more frustrated. What do you mean by going off in the middle of the night like that? I never even heard you leave, and usually you're so noisy. What is going on, George? And for the record, this is not funny, not remotely. I can see you're amused, but I'm not laughing. What am I supposed to do when I wake up to find your side of the bed ice cold? It freaked me the hell out. At the very least, you could have had the courtesy to tell me where you were going. If you must know, I was feeling restless. I got up in the middle of the night and went for a drive. You were sound asleep, sleeping like a baby. I didn't have the heart to wake you up. You looked so peaceful, I lied. It's not like you to be so thoughtful, George, said my wife scathingly. Even when you go trooping downstairs for a glass of milk in the middle of the night... It's like a tornado has blown into the house. With your feet stomping across the floorboards like a great big bull elephant. And now you're actually claiming to be worried about waking me. You do surprise me. You're not usually like this. If you consider yourself considerate, you could have actually woken me up. Or left me a note to tell me where you were going. My wife physically scowled. She did not look best pleased with me. And frankly, I couldn't blame her. If she pulled a similar stunt on me, I would be more than a little affronted. I shrugged my shoulders nonchalantly. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. I should have left you a note. I guess I was not thinking. You're damn right, George. You weren't thinking. For once we agree on something. I've been worried sick about you. You went for a drive in the middle of the night. Are you completely insane? Who does that? The annoyance on my wife's face grew into concern, as the lines in between her brows puckered up into a puzzled look. You're not nursing a secret, are you, George? She asked me questioningly. Oh, my God! You are, aren't you, George? She said, cupping her mouth. You're hiding something very significant from me, aren't you? What is all this about? You need to tell me. No, I'm not, I said defensively wondering how my wife could have guessed. I thought about the little Bigfoot tucked away in the surgery fast asleep. I could not tell my wife about her. If I did share my secret with her, the next thing is that the whole of Kentucky would know about the poor little critter, and congregations of inquisitive people would be gathering outside my surgery to take a look at the little creature that deserved her privacy and respect. Our home would become like the travelling circus in the 1800s, where you'd pay big money to observe unusual oddities, like a woman with four legs, or two conjoined twins. The next thing the news would be splashed over the local papers. Vet finds baby Bigfoot in the back of his truck, which he is treating for sepsis. I needed that kind of drama in my life like a hole in the head. I hated any kind of attention on me, and reporters wanting to write a sensational story was something that made me physically shudder. 
The little Bigfoot deserved her privacy. These creatures were clearly elusive and quiet by nature, which had helped them survive very successfully for centuries, I suspect. And I was not going to mess that up for this little Bigfoot. Don't get me wrong. While I loved my wife dearly, she had a mouth on her that could wander rather too freely for her own good, and she could get so carried away. My wife was incapable of keeping a secret. I remember once she told everyone that she was hosting a surprise birthday party for me, two weeks before the event, and I learnt all about it on the day she began clandestinely organising the surprise for me. I had to stand in front of my mirror when I was shaving, practising how I was going to react, trying to look surprised when I entered my house on the day of my party, and all my friends emerged from behind the sofas to say boo, and to wish me happy birthday, when I knew all about it. "'No, of course not,' I said, trying to avoid eye contact with my wife. "'Why would you say that?' "'Oh, my God! You're sick, aren't you, George? That's what this is about. That's why you're behaving so furtively. You don't want to worry me. What is it you've got?' Oh, my word, you haven't got prostate cancer, have you? Isla's husband's got prostate cancer, you know. But it is treatable. He's going to make a full recovery. He's been declared cancer-free. Whatever it is, you're not telling me, George. We can get through this together. We're a team. I cannot bear to think of you taking long, lonely trips in the middle of the night in your car, worrying about your condition, and too afraid to tell me about it. As I keep saying, George, we'll do this together. We're a team. This is what marriage is all about. Have you forgotten our vows? In sickness and health, till death us do part. I'm fine, sweetheart. Don't be so dramatic. There is nothing at all wrong with me, I assured her. Can't a man take a drive in a night, just for a little space? What? You think I'm crowding you? Is that what this is about? Asked my wife. Of course not, darling. I just fancied a drive in the middle of the night. That's all, I lied. And you promise me you're not sick, she asked me gingerly, studying me curiously. Because if I find you are, George, I won't forgive you for keeping such a monumental secret from me. Do you understand? We do things together. But of course I understand. I wouldn't have it any other way. I assure you, sweetheart, I am not sick. My wife seemed reasonably satisfied that I wasn't duplicitously hiding anything from her. But for the next few days she began watching me like a hawk, even when I was shaving in the bathroom. I could not escape the feeling of her eyes burning into the back of my neck. Worse still, I noticed that she had rifled through my drawers and cupboards, as if trying to assure herself that I was not suffering from a deadly disease that I was keeping secret from her. She was looking for a doctor's report, announcing that I only had six months left to live. My wife was quite the drama queen. I regret to say she'd never believe I'd snuck out in the middle of the night to meet a lover, or that I was cheating on her in any way. Indeed, if anyone would suggest such a preposterous, ludicrous idea, she'd probably laugh at them, with the absurdity of such a suggestion. What? George having an affair? Never! No, George would never have an affair. Are you kidding me? I mean, who would actually have him? I'm not that bad looking, I told her once. Why is it so crazy to assume I could never have an affair? You may be handsome, George, but my God, getting anything out of you is like extracting blood out of a stone. Women like men who have a silver tongue on them and can charm them. But no, you're very quiet. You're very withdrawn, aren't you, George? But I'm charming, I insisted. You're reticent, my sweetheart. You haven't got the seductive tongue, have you? You're a very contained person. Most people are very unaware of what a treasure you are, because you keep yourself tightly buttoned up, don't you? It's like having a beautiful ring tucked away in a jewellery box which I'm the only one that gets to see. I'm a very lucky woman. I was the one fortunate to discover that there was so much more to you than actually meets the eye. When we first dated, I remember thinking you were such a dreadful bore. I was planning to break up with you, you know, but I didn't have the heart to hurt your feelings. But the more time I spent with you, 
I realized to my astonishment, I actually like this man a hell of a lot. Most women would not be as long-suffering as I am, you see. Most women would think you're a tad boring, and no one wants to hang out with someone who's dreadfully dull. And that's what most people assume you are, George. Lovely, I thought. I wouldn't describe myself as boring, but my wife clearly thought I was. So the less said about that, the better. Thankfully, the little Bigfoot in my charge did not find me boring at all. Her cute little brown eyes would watch me curiously as I attended to her every need. She had made friends with the magpies, and I would find all three of them playing together on the floor when I opened the surgery, as the female Bigfoot had let them out of their bird cage. The two magpies were perching on her shoulders and looked incredibly contented, playing around with their toys I'd got them and trotting across the floor with the toys in their beaks. I was amazed that the little Bigfoot was actually mimicking the magpie's squawks, and I think those birds assumed the Bigfoot was also a magpie. The little Bigfoot even copied my mannerisms when I attended to her, and I have to say her foot was healing fast. She had recovered from the fever, and the blue tissue on her foot was becoming pink and healthy. The Bigfoot child certainly had a stronger constitution than most humans, and that did not surprise me in the least. When I attended to her foot, her hands would run through my hair, touch my skin, frolic with my earlobes, and she'd make a cute chuckling sound, as if she was laughing. <coughs> she put some silver tinsel in my hair, and began to whoop with delight, circling around me, as if she was playing round and round the mulberry bush. She told me her name was Zaria, but beyond that I couldn't understand a word she was saying, because she spoke so fast. I had been feeding the Bigfoot human food, and she seemed to be particularly partial to apple pie. She enjoyed sausages and mash, and plenty of fruit salad. The treatment protocol which I'd used on her worked remarkably well, and I had in mind that the following evening I would drop the Bigfoot where I'd found her, although it might be tricky to find the exact location. But I was sure the little Bigfoot would have a sense of where I should go, and would likely point out where I needed to drop her off. I was surprised what a girly girl Zalia was, with her feminine gestures and very gentle mannerisms. She was so endearing. If the truth be told, she was like any other regular toddler, and I almost forgot she was a Bigfoot. It was surprising she didn't stink, given that she had come wrapped in a manky pelt. Needless to say, on the morning that I had hidden the Bigfoot away in my surgery, from the prying eyes of my astute wife, she was the one to discover the pelt lying in the middle of the driveway. My wife thought that a woman in the church that she had fallen out with had purposely dropped the nasty thing in the middle of our driveway, and she was very indignant about it. I'm not sure all the details of the dispute my wife was having with this woman, and frankly I didn't want to know, although it was likely the whole church had been informed of the shenanigans between my wife and Flora Whittle. From what I had learnt, Flora had said something offensive about my wife's carrot cake, describing it as dry and tasteless and my wife had overheard her snide remarks and reacted very adversely to her criticism. The two of them had since become mortal enemies, prickly and very angry, lashing out at each other at any opportunity. So there was no love lost between the two women, who seemed to wind each other up by merely looking at each other. "'I don't bloody believe it,' said my wife. "'The nerve of the woman! How can she stoop this low? Even I wouldn't do something like that!' She's only gone and flung a pelt in the middle of our driveway just to get her revenge on me because I told her that her carrot cake was so vile it had made me vomit. What a bitch! This thing, wherever she got it, it stinks to high heaven and I'm going to get her back for this. What a cow that woman is! Hold on a moment, I said to my wife. You don't know where the bear pelt came from. You can't just jump to conclusions like this. "'Have you smelt the bloody thing?' said my wife. "'It reeks! No one would ever throw a pelt into our driveway, except Flora Whittle. "'She never liked me one bit. "'She told me the other day she was going to make me pay for being so rude about her carrot cake. "'She's not going to get away with this,' said my wife, swaggering furiously. "'I watched with horror as my wife removed the pelt from the driveway with gloves and stuffed it in a plastic torp. "'that she put in the trunk of her car. "'I groaned, but I couldn't tell her the truth about that pelt. "'Where are you going?' I asked her. "'To make a fragrant delivery to Flora Whittle.' 
said my wife with a smug sense of satisfaction. I don't think that's a good idea, love. I think you've got this dreadfully wrong, I had said. I hastened to say witnesses saw my wife unloading a manky pelt on Flora Whittle's driveway. Flora Whittle had come thundering out of her house, looking absolutely livid, asking my wife what the hell she was doing. I'm returning your fragrant delivery, said my wife, pointing an accusatory finger at Flora. Don't think I don't know what you've been doing behind my back, Flora. I'm not a complete idiot. And for the record, I think you should consider taking your pelt to the cleaners because it stinks. But no cleaner is going to take that thing in. Flora Whittle was enraged, and I believe my wife and Flora began to pull each other's hair, like two belligerent teenagers, while a neighbour of Flora's tore them apart. Ladies, calm down. There's no reason for two mature adults to be behaving like this. Of course she denied that she had thrown a bear pelt into our driveway, but my wife told me she knew differently, and that Flora Whittle had done this. And so it would seem the love and hate relationship between Flora and my wife persisted. One night, when the Bigfoot was still in my charge, I woke up with a firm voice in my head that was not my own, telling me to take the Bigfoot to the place where I initially found her, wherever that was. I glanced down at my wife in bed. As usual, she had managed to steal a few of my sheets, and appeared to be enfolded in them, with one arm outstretched. She appeared to be in such a deep sleep, more so than usual, and a soft snore was emanating from her parted lips. I even called out her name, but she failed to respond. She really was dead to the world. I sat up with a jolt, wondering if I really had heard the strange voice in my head, and then I heard it again. The instructions were clear, precise, and earnest. I knew the inner voice did not come from my own head. It was a little like hearing the voice of God in your mind. I knew I had to listen to this voice, and so I unhesitantly climbed out of bed and scrambled over to my cupboard, where I pulled out some jeans, a pair of sneakers, and a couple of warm sweaters. We always have a night light on in our bedroom, and on the landing, as there is nothing worse than stumbling around in the darkness, trying to navigate your way around the house. I found the night light helped me to be a lot less clumsy on my feet, but try as I might to be quiet, I was not doing a good job. I kept expecting my wife to wake up and give me the third degree of what I was doing. At one point my car keys went crashing onto the ground. I stood very still, my heart pounding in my chest, as I waited for my wife to wake up, but she was dead to the world. She had heard nothing. This was a first, I thought as I tried to discreetly slip down the staircase, out of the kitchen door towards the garage. I was making quite a noise, opening garage doors, backing my car out of the open doors. I glanced up at our bedroom window, but no light came on. I sighed with relief and scurried over to the surgery. When I opened the surgery door, the cute little Bigfoot was waiting for me. She had a green blanket swaddled over her body. She knew I was taking her back to the place I'd found her when I discovered her lying in the back seat of my car. How could she even know my intentions? Had the strange voice that had instructed me to take her to the place where I discovered her spoken to her too? It would seem so. The magpies were making quite a commotion as she left, clearly upset to see her go. But the Bigfoot turned around and looked at them, and they immediately seemed to calm down. Without a word, she followed me on her little feet to the car, and climbed into the front seat next to me. She began to point out the directions. It was like she knew exactly where I was taking her. For one so young, I was completely confounded. If I put a two-year-old in my car, and asked him or her to point out the way to the local town, they would have no sense of direction whatsoever. But this little Bigfoot knew where I was going and without her guidance I would have never found that sequestered country road, where I'd found myself parked a few nights ago. When I arrived on the scene, I recognised the road at once, and the ominous woodgrove that had terrified the bejesus out of me. I knew I would never ever venture into those woods again. Luckily had there been no reports of an old lady found lying dead in the woods, so I marvelled over what those lights were that I had seen that night that had been flashing an SOS signal, and why it was that I had found myself on a remote country road, with no memory of having driven there. I sat in the car with the Bigfoot by my side, and waited. I wasn't sure what I was waiting for, but
but I sensed that that was what I was meant to do. The blazing lights of my headlights lit up the dark road ahead of me. I gasped as I looked at the trees. Once again I saw the light flashes, three fast ones, three slow ones. I grimaced at the memory of my trip through those trees, the dreadful feeling of being watched, the eyes burning into the back of my neck, the menacing whistles I had heard. I recoiled at the memory, and my breathing quickened. The little Bigfoot looked troubled when she saw me almost hyperventilate. She squeezed my hand, reassuringly, and in a trice a sense of calm flooded over me. It was a cool night that reminded me that winter was on the precipice of being birthed, and soon no deciduous trees would carry the weight of their leaves on their sculptural boughs. A playful breeze was blowing some fallen leaves up in the air, like airborne golden confetti, while the soft moonlight, with its pearly prisms, seemed to shimmer over the road, complementing the lights of my car. All of a sudden I heard the sound of movement, as if something ponderously large was moving towards us. It sounded like heavy, thunderous feet, emerging through the lofty trees. That was when I saw a dark, shadowy silhouette, that at first looked like a large blob. For a moment the blob stopped, and then I saw a bright pair of yellow eyes, at about eight feet off the ground, staring in our direction, and then the figure bounded hurriedly towards us, moving like the wind, and swinging a pair of overlong arms backwards and forwards. That was when I saw the bullet-shaped silhouette, the large shoulders getting closer and closer to me, and the creature looked as if it was floating as it moved, even though the sound of her feet was very powerful. I knew at once that this was the Bigfoot's mother. Instead of feeling fear, I felt an indescribable excitement. I had grown incredibly attached to the small female Bigfoot, and I knew meeting the mother would be an incredible privilege. If I had seen that figure gallivanting towards me on the night I'd first discovered the little Bigfoot in the back of my truck, I don't mind admitting I'd have run for the hills with an impending sense of dread, believing my life was in perilous danger. But on this night, when a soft moonlight peppered the road, I was filled with a wondrous sense of awe. Then there she was, the large female Bigfoot, standing there, three feet away from my car. Her yellow eyes focused earnestly on my truck. I opened the door for the little Bigfoot to get out. She climbed out of my truck hurriedly, running ebulliently towards her mother, and the interaction between mother and daughter being reunited again was remarkably human, as the female Bigfoot grabbed her baby and threw her up and down in her arms. She then put her Bigfoot child on the ground and examined her youngling's foot that was perfectly healed. The little Bigfoot was delighted to show her mother her foot and began to demonstrate that she could walk on it properly and that it no longer hurt. I had climbed out of my car and was standing there in the road watching this wonderful interaction, my eyes almost glistening with tears. I was so moved by the love of this devoted mother. Even though the light of my headlights were on and my engine was still purring like a contented cat, I remained standing on the road my hair being assaulted by the hands of an icy cool breeze, just locked up in the moment. The female Bigfoot stood up proud and tall, her imposing, almost regal presence, made all the more detailed by the light of my headlights. I could see her clearly. Her humanness took me aback. I almost expected her to have primate qualities, but beyond her overlong arms, bullet-shaped head, and long, flowing dark hair, she was uncannily human. Although the features of her face were more chiselled, with prominent cheekbones, a flat nose and hooded eyes, but like her daughter, she was incredibly feminine. I observed her movements and hand gestures were almost ballerinic. She stood stoically still for a moment, studying me curiously. There was a thankful benevolence in her eyes, and then she spoke to me in a language that seemed to melt in my mind into English like the butter on a bagel. I knew exactly what she was saying. Kilata kilano kwa, hasa shikenasi, holoto basi, lina tila kwa. Thank you for your help. When I saw you lancing the boils of the cows on that farm, I knew you could help me with my daughter's foot. You know, the funny thing is, I thought someone was watching me then. 
Colotta e la cacqua, o passi latti, l'aquilo no po, si nasce acqua sa, alicolo. You shouldn't doubt your feelings. That's the problem with your kind. You always doubt your gut instincts, which is why you never progress. If you were more in tune with your senses, you'd be astonishingly sophisticated. But all your doubting is one of your kind's greatest stumbling blocks. When you entered the forest the other night, you were terrified. You knew you were being watched. You thought you were being pursued by a great evil. You were being watched by eyes that were wanting to ensure you could be trusted. They were my friends, who are far from evil. I'm sorry we gave you quite the scare. But when someone is looking into your mind, it is an intrusive feeling. And that's what they were doing, which is why you were so unsettled. Così cansa, aquilono, sashi calacuasi, licatilono po, casaconolo. I admit, the one that called out to you in your sleep was me. I sent you here tonight to drop my daughter off. I fed her the directions to bring her back to me safely tonight. Thank you so much for treating her. I knew I could trust you, and that was affirmed to me by my friends. Thank you for not telling others of your kind about us. It is important for us to protect our privacy. You're probably wondering how I can speak to you in my own language, but you understand every word. I admit, it does stump me a little bit, I told her. Quilocotta, sakilaswa, monopata, nicolosa. I can communicate like this. It's a telepathic exchange, you see. We can employ the communication we wish, but sometimes we choose not to. I thought as much, I said. Kilati lonoko, hasakasha, zalia, tolopati laki, akolo sopa. I just want to thank you for taking care of Zalia. Thanks to you, her foot is healed. And I will be indebted to you for your great kindness. It's a pleasure. I'm very happy to have helped. Kalakika, Zalia. Where are you going? Zalia asked her mother, as her daughter ran back to my truck to retrieve the green blanket, which she showed her mother, who looked up at me to affirm that her daughter could have the blanket. It's hers, I said. She's welcome to it. The female Bigfoot thanked me again, tossed her daughter with the blanket onto her shoulders and nodded. She began to whistle, and I heard all kinds of whistles being returned through the trees. And then, to my amazement, she was gone, and I found there were tears in my eyes. This had indeed been a magical experience for me. But when I returned home, I was greeted by a very indignant wife. Where have you been? she asked me. You've done it again, George. Disappeared in the middle of the night. If I told you, you wouldn't believe me, I told her. Try me, she said. If you must know, I was meeting a very elegant woman with dark hair on a sequestered country road. My wife rolled her eyes in the back of her head. You're telling me you're having an affair, George? Like I'd believe that in a month of Sundays. Oh, please, who would have you? Well, you asked me. I told you. So there you are. That's my story. The Missing Story of Judy Pengeli. Names and places have been changed for the privacy of those concerned. Judy, Judy, is the name that echoes through the woodgroves and hangs on to the boughs of trees and is whispered through the cold, crisp April air. The bright colour of neon jackets flash through the trees as searchers scale the woods, leaving no stone unturned. The lugubrious mood is solemn, and the gloomy atmosphere is picked up by the trees and the indigenous wildlife, who lightly sense some trouble is amiss. The sound of Judy's name bounces back to the searchers, like a tennis ball being flung at the wall. A disembodied, haunted, airy echo of their own deflated voices returning right back to them. They wait and listen to see if they can hear any sound in return. A pitiful cry, perhaps, a small little voice calling out for help, but they hear nothing beyond the rustle of the gentle breeze whipping through the trees. The searchers still cling urgently onto a defeated hope that is slowly beginning to wither and deflate like a dying flower in the vase or like a balloon that loses all its gas. 
the determination of the tenacious search team is resolute, for no one is prepared to give up, as all want to find the whereabouts of Judy Bengali. Many who have volunteered with the search know the young teenager well, and they also know that she would never choose to willingly disappear like this. For Judy, well known to many in these parts, is a reliable, prudent teenager who wears her heart on her sleeve and is well liked by many of the local folk in town. The sound of a helicopter hovers above the trees, searching and looking for any sign of the 18-year-old teenager as each hour marches forward. Like the sands in an hourglass, the mood becomes increasingly more sombre. On the road where she was last seen, 30 hours earlier, are more policemen and emergency workers, whose vehicles have gathered on the road in a large cluster. Many emergency workers are poking around in the bushy undergrowth and stopping passing motorists to ask one question. Have you seen a slim teenager with strawberry blonde hair, fair skin? pale blue eyes and a scattering of freckles on her nose wearing a bright pink fleece-lined waterproof jacket she was last seen on this road walking home on her own at about midnight after a fight with her boyfriend chris hilton the search party despite their exhaustion and the chill of a cool april morning continued to frantically look for the eighteen-year-old teenager but alas their tireless exhaustive search is fruitless all are poignantly aware that this dreadful scenario could have easily happened to them and inauspiciously played out in their own lives. It could be their daughter or son that was missing, and it is these bodeful reoccurring revelations that urge the search party still forward, deeper and deeper and deeper into the heart of the woods, more determined than ever to find the location of the missing girl. The town sheriff looks as if he's been dragged through a hedge backwards. He's completely battered, his eyes puffy, his body weighed down by exhaustion, as the urgency of this search, which has uncovered no leads, has finally sucked the very life out of him. He knows that someone knows the whereabouts of Judy. He sifts through all manners of scenarios in his head. Did a stranger pick her up, perhaps? Was she abducted? Is she lying in the woods having met with a dreadful accident or a fortuitous fall? Did someone cause her grievous bodily harm? The sheriff's expression is grim. His teeth have begun grinding all day. Something his dentist is always telling him to stop doing. But he can't help himself, as when he's stressed out, the grinding becomes for him a self-soothing gesture. The sheriff looks as if the last thirty hours have completely knocked the stuffing out of him, and in the weeks that follow, the sheriff's dark hair will turn completely grey. He feels completely responsible for Judy's disappearance, as it occurred under his watch, as sheriff of the small town, where crime is as alien as the skin on his own back. But the missing teenager will leave many people wondering whether the security of their small town will be forever compromised and never the same again. Two search dogs trained to find missing people are gainfully employed for the job at hand. One is a cocker spaniel called Tea Leaf, and the other is a black Labrador called Sniffer. They are both instructed by their handlers, after sniffing a nightshirt belonging to Judy, to find the girl. But the trail of the scent reaches a dead end. There are no positive outcomes. The search dogs follow the route Judy had taken down that long, dark, sequestered road in the dead of night when she had left her boyfriend's house. Then they stop on the road and sit down to look up at their handlers, affirming that they'd reached the end of the trail. Both handlers conclude that she must have been picked up by a vehicle, as the dogs can no longer follow a trail once a vehicle is involved, and there are tyre marks uncovered on the road that are photographed and studied by the police. The searchers, although very cold, remain undaunted, they continued to call out her name, Judy, 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 again and again. But the only sound they hear is the agitated noise of the birds scuttling in the branches above their heads, clearly annoyed by this rude and vacious intrusion on their privacy. A sense of foreboding crushes the hearts of the searchers, most fearless sense of impending dread, 
as they navigate their way through the woodgroves and trudge across the sequestered beaches of this Washington seaside town on the Pacific Peninsula. And the questions that everyone has on their mind is where is Judy Bengali? Beaches have been tirelessly searched, woodgroves have been scanned from top to bottom, but still there is no sign of the young lady. The searchers still tentatively employ the spirit of optimism. You have to in this circumstance, despite the fact that their hearts are heavy, with a sense of foreboding that whispers to their spirits, warning them that no matter how much they search, they will never be able to find the teenager. As can be expected, in any small seaside town, rumours abound, and the town busybody, Luan Mayer, is gabbling away like a goose with a long, garrulous beak. The woman can't stop blabbing, and she's delighting in horrifying the locals with her gruelling suggestions of what had happened to Judy Bengali. She is loving every minute of this small-town drama, in which she wants to play a very significant part. The unassuming small woman, with her brown, bird-like eyes, that are always darting over the place, watching everyone, are fully exercised today. I know Chris Meyer has something to do with Judy Bengali's disappearance. Of course he has. I know everybody thinks so well of the young man. She tells everyone who will listen. You mark my words. He may be the town's sweetheart, but he's got some skeletons in his cupboard, I tell you. People think butter won't melt in his mouth. But I'm guessing that there is a dark side to him. I personally think he killed Judy. He's buried her under their front patio. They need to get the police to the house and dig up that patio, because I am sure they will find her body there. The parents probably know exactly what happened to the girl, but are keeping Storm on his behalf. Then, of course, we mustn't forget, there is Russ Edwards. Now that young man, he is incredibly sketchy. Everyone knows he's fancied Judy Bengali forever and a day. It's no secret in town. You only have to look at the way he looks at that girl. He's got a thing for redheads, you know. Maybe he couldn't handle the rejection. He could have also murdered Judy. Maybe he followed her to her boyfriend's house. Couldn't believe his luck when she was walking home alone on that road, without a single soul in sight. Then she refused his advances, and then he struck her with a stone at the side of her head and threw her body into the ocean. Now I would not put it past him at all. If he couldn't have her, as far as he was concerned, no one else could. Maybe she'll be found washed up on a beach, tangled up in seaweed. Oh dear, oh dear, said Luanne Minor. Now don't give me a look like that, Sophie dear. I saw you roll your eyes at me. Now I'm only saying what you're all privately thinking. You just haven't got the boldness to say it. You all know these thoughts are going on in your mind as well. Oh dear, oh dear, what on earth is the world coming to? She said, wiping the sweat away from her face with a handkerchief. It's just so tragic. Honestly, such a lovely girl. The town is never going to be the same without her. Many of the locals looked at Luanne Meyer with withered glances, hoping that she was spouting all kinds of nonsense, like an overboiling teapot on the hob, as none of them wanted to believe that any of their own was responsible for Judy's disappearance. You should shut your mouth, Luanne, said Doris Arkin. Honestly, will you ever stop gossiping? We do not know what happened to Judy Bengali, so stop smearing people's reputations with your poisonous suggestions. We're sure that Chris Hilton and Russ Edwards had absolutely nothing to do with Judy's disappearance. But are the townsfolk sure about that? No one can be certain about anything. And years after the event, people discuss over their bowls of cereal at breakfast time what did happen to Judy Bengali. Some are resigned to the fact that maybe they will not know. But underneath the stoic faces of the townsfolk, there is a restlessness. The not knowing of what happened to Judy has robbed many a local of a good night's sleep.
and left some people concerning themselves with double bolting their doors at night. After all, you can never be sure who or what is out there. The previous evening, April the 10th, 1983. Fifteen-year-old Bobby Hilton is lying across his bed, flicking through his comic magazine, chuckling at some of the pictures when he hears the loud argument outside the front door of their home. He puts down his magazine briefly and moves over clandestinely to the window of his room on the second floor of their double-storey wooden panelled home. He discreetly drags up the sash window and listens intently to the argument. He's never heard his brother argue like this before, with his girlfriend Judy Bengali. Bobby does not have much time for his brother Chris, who is a rising football star at school, and a successful sportsman, but also a big bully. And throughout his young life he's been bullied and patronised tirelessly by his brother, who calls him the unfortunate name Squirt. It would seem all his brother's friends have adopted the seemingly affectionate name, and are also always calling him Squirt. He hates being constantly patronised, humiliated and belittled by his brother Chris, who is always doing something to deride him and make fun of him. He has been the butt of his brother's jokes since the very day he was born. His brother has baited him throughout his life, and he is tired of it. Bobby has always been afraid of his bigger brother, and in his opinion, they've never been particularly close. He doubts he ever will be. His brother has always looked down on him. Worse still, he's got quite the temper on him, and on one occasion, when he'd had an altercation with his brother, Bobby remembers he was so scared that his brother Chris was going to kill him as the enraged look on his crimson face when his fists hovered above his brother's head were menacious. He had stared up at his brother in horror with a pleading look in his eyes, waiting for that powerful fist to thrash his skull in. For a second, the savage look on his brother's face had dissipated, to be replaced by a gormless grin. Oh my God, Squirt! You thought I was going to kill you, didn't you? You should have seen your face. It was hilarious. Give me more credit, will you? You may be my annoying little brother who winds me up the wrong way and gets the hell on my nerves. But give me a break, Squirt. I'd never hurt a hair on your head. I'm your brother, for God's sake. Why the hell do you think I'm going to hurt you? I might box your ears within an inch of your life, but I would never willingly put you in a hospital bed, Squirt, he said, rubbing an affectionate hand through his brother's curly blonde hair. Bobby will never forget the day when his brother Chris brought home Judy Pengeli for dinner one night. He had been starstruck by the stunning young lady with the red blonde hair they call Strawberry Blonde or Titian. From the get-go, he had eyed her through star-studded eyes, as if she was a celebrity. In his eyes, Judy Bengali was the most beautiful beguiling girl he'd ever beheld. He could not comprehend why such a pretty young lady, who was also eighteen years old like his brother, could have any interest in him at all. If she had a bird's-eye view on what his brother was really like, he was sure Judy would run a mile but he knew love could be incredibly blind, as people always chose to see what they wanted to see. Every girl in the school had eyes for his big brother, so why would Judy Bengeli be any different? This is Judy, Mum and Dad, Chris had said proudly, when he introduced his parents to his new girlfriend one evening. Oh, it's so wonderful to meet you, Mrs Hilton had said to her, her bright eyes warmly welcoming Judy into their home. Chris had first invited her to dinner. Let me introduce you, Judy, to my silly little brother Squirt, he said, ruffling up his brother's hair affectionately, as if Bobby was a cute little toddler. Bobby was furious. Don't do that to me, Chris, said Bobby, pulling away in disgust from his brother, straightening up his ruffled hair. I'm not two years old, for God's sake. I'm only three years younger than you are. Don't treat me like a baby. Keep your hair on, bro, said Chris with a big wicked grin on his face, delighting in his brother's aggrieved reaction. Bobby here, he said to Judy, is quite the sensitive soul. 
It doesn't take much to ruffle his feathers, as you can see. Sometimes I just can't help myself. Chris had cruelly belittled him in front of Judy, in front of this gorgeous young lady. Judy flashed a bright warm smile at Bobby and said, Hello, Bobby. It's so lovely to meet you. Your brother here has told me so much about you. Bobby had inwardly squirmed. He couldn't imagine his brother saying anything nice about him to his girlfriend, Judy. No doubt he'd told Judy what a prize wuss he was, and told her in detail about all the mischievous, clever stunts he'd subjected his brother to. How Bobby had reacted after he'd put cockroaches in his boot, maggots in his peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and about the bucket of water that he'd put above Bobby's door, that had come tumbling all over his suit before the family was about to attend a wedding. Don't look so worried, said Judy, studying the annoyed furrow developing on Bobby's face. Your brother's only ever been singing your praises, you know, but he tells me he gets a complete kick out of winding you up. If you want my advice, don't give him any kind of reaction. If you don't respond to his tricks, he won't enjoy poking fun at you. We have a cat at home that toys with mice all the time and they squeak and run, and she chases after them. One day the mouse played dead, and did not respond to my cat when she poured it. So the cat grew bored. The mouse in the end got away. Hear that, Bobby, said Mrs Hilton, smiling fondly at Judy. Your brother will stop winding you up if you don't give him what he wants. Judy is exactly right about that. You give him such a perfect reaction. That's why he does what he does to you. While their advice was well-meaning, Bobby knew it was easier said than done. It wasn't easy not to react to the stunts that Chris Hilton pulled on him. Bobby had never told Chris how he had clandestinely nursed a secret crush over his girlfriend for as long as Judy had been part of their lives. He knew that such a fixation over his brother's girlfriend would go down like a lead balloon with Chris. If his brother knew the truth, he'd likely scoff and say something insulting like, Judy, interested in you, squirt. Give me a break. You're still a baby, barely out of nappies. It would seem his brother Chris and Judy were very keen on each other, and for a long while his brother nurtured a much nicer personality. It must have been the positive influences of his girlfriend. It was a given that his brother was completely smitten by Judy, and he'd say one thing about his brother. He had excellent taste in women but that was where his admiration for his brother began and ended. It was not long before Judy became a fixture and fitting in the Hilton household, like a piece of treasured, much-loved furniture you always enjoyed having around. Judy was not just a pretty face. She had a very kind heart and was generous and warm. She was excellent at math, so much so that Bobby would use any excuse in the book to ask her for help with his math homework, just so he could get close enough to smell the whiff of her perfume. Judy always smelt so lovely. She wore Miss Dior, and he loved the smell on her. You like it, she'd say, smiling at Bobby. It's my signature perfume. I won't wear anything else. So on this inauspicious night, when the Hilton family's lives would change in ways they never imagined possible, when everything would go badly awry in the small town for so many, Bobby slunk closely to the window, he eavesdropped on the argument that Chris was having with Judy. Judy was very upset and quite affronted, expressing her extreme indignance with a fiery impertinence that literally matched her hair. I can't believe you'd believe I'd do that to you, Chris. I've never, ever been unfaithful. It's not fair for you to assume the worst of me. Why don't you trust me? You've got this all horribly wrong. I thought you knew me better than that. I'd never set out to humiliate you. You know I wouldn't. Trust has to be earned, Judy. And you don't know the meaning of the word, do you? Do you think I'm an idiot, Judy? Do you think I'm an idiot? Look at me. Do I look like an idiot? Where is this coming from, Chris? Listen to yourself. You sound so bloody insecure. Of course you're not an idiot, Chris. Anyone can see that. But you've got this horribly wrong. Yes, Russ has been coming on to me, but I told him I'm not interested. Listen, I'm not interested. Nothing has ever happened between us. Yes, I admit I'm always nice to him, 
But he's a nice bloke. I hold my hands up to that. But I'm nice to everyone, aren't I? That is who I am. Just because I'm nice doesn't mean I fancy someone. Nice, nice. Is that the only word you can employ? For God's sake, Judy, I'm not an idiot. That is not what I heard. I heard lover boy Russ Edwards was groveling over you like a lecherous jerk. So typical of him. I gather he's been whispering sweet nothings to you in the public library. Several people saw him whispering in your ear. You were giggling. Hear that? You were giggling. Later you were seen at the park on the beach, talking to him on the swings. And I heard this from Simon. He phoned to tell me about it. He witnessed it. He said the two of you looked very cosy together. Do you think you're going to take me for a joke? I can imagine everyone in town is having a good old laugh behind my back. Especially Luanne Meyer. She's probably in her element, having a field day. Saying, poor, poor Chris Hilton. He doesn't even realise that Russ Edwards and Judy Bengali are now an item. Do you know how humiliating that is for me? Do you have any idea? It's crushing, Judy. Crushing. How can you do this to me? I do have my pride, you know. Does our relationship mean nothing to you? How do you think I feel about all this? Of course you're not an idiot. But your friend Simon is meddling into things he doesn't understand. He's barking up the wrong tree. I'm not remotely interested in Russ Edwards. He's funny. He makes me laugh. But that's it. I might have flirted with him, but it was harmless fun. It didn't mean anything. I guess I'm flattered by his attention, that's all. It doesn't mean anything is going on between us. I was talking to him in the library because he told me he liked me a lot. I told him that his advances had to stop, that it would upset you. I was on the beach swing and he came up to me and sat next to me on the swing opposite. I told him I liked him as a friend. He was funny, but there's nothing more going on between us. Yes, he tried to kiss me. I pushed him away and he walked away. He told me I was being a tease and was upset with me for leading him on. But I told him, like I'm telling you now, that I was just being nice. Why don't you get that? For once in my life, I agree with Russ Edwards. You're a tease, Judy, a flirt with everyone. Because you know they fancy you. It gives you a kick, doesn't it? You love it, don't you? You love being the centre of everybody's attention. I've got to sit back and watch you belittle me like this. Make a fool out of me. I won't stand for this. Do you understand it? You're my girlfriend and you're frolicking around with everyone. You make me sick, Judy. I've had enough of you. Get out of my sight. I can't stand to look at you right now. You completely disgust me. As the voices got more and more inflamed, and the argument persisted, Bobby's brother spit out some vicious words at his girlfriend Judy that were vile. Bobby blocked them out of his head, pretending not to hear them. His brother's words were cruel and derogatory. He had called his girlfriend a whore. I mean, who does that? Bobby blocked his ears. He couldn't believe Chris was talking to Judy like this. Her flirtatious personality was part of her whimsical charm. But she had been devoutly loyal to his brother. He knew that. His brother knew that. And so did everybody else. Yet, as usual, his brother was reacting adversely, trying to tear Judy apart limb from limb, like a truculent cantankerous bull, having a temper tantrum in a field of bluebells, tearing the delicate, beautiful flowers apart with his rampaging hooves, not appreciating how perfect those bluebells were. They were fragile and needed to be treated with respect like Judy did. Why did he not leave Judy alone and give her the respect she deserved? He knew his brother was furiously jealous. That was what this was all about. Bobby wanted to go downstairs to tell his brother to stop upsetting Judy, but he shrank back into the shadows, terribly afraid of any confrontation with his brother. He didn't fancy being beat up by his brother for butting into his brother's affairs. Please, Chris, listen! I haven't done anything wrong. Why are you being so unreasonable? Why are you behaving like this? You're reacting so adversely over nothing. Please, please, 
please don't be like this. She was obviously crying. Tears were spilling down her pretty cheeks, but Chris did not soften at the sight of his girlfriend's tears. He seemed to be hissing at her. Get out of my sight, Judy. You disgust me. Why don't you go off to love a boy? He taunted. Call him now. Ask Russ to pick you up. You're not getting a lift from me tonight, he said, slamming the door behind him. You can walk home yourself as far as I'm concerned. Personally, I prefer not to pick up hookers. I do have my standards, you know. Please open up. Open up. Chris, Chris, let's talk about this. You can't just leave me standing outside your front door. You've got to let me in. Please let me in, Chris. Let's talk about this. Don't be so unreasonable. Bobby peered curiously outside the window to see the beleaguered, deflated figure of poor Judy. She looked fatigued. Her eyes were red and puffy from the tears she had shed. His heart went out to her. She was furiously hammering on the front door. Bobby! Bobby! Please open up! Don't be so mean! You're being so mean! I don't want to go on... I, 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 please! Please, Bobby! I need to phone my father. At least he can come and pick me up from your house. I don't want to walk on that dark road all on my own. It's scary walking at home or walking home in the dark. No, please, please, Chris, don't be so unreasonable. How Bobby wished his parents were not away in Seattle. His father would have driven Judy home himself and would have been absolutely furious with Chris. There would be many if onies after this event. What was his brother thinking, letting Judy take the 25-minute walk home when it was so dark outside? It was ten minutes past twelve, for goodness sake. Bobby knew that no gentleman would abandon a woman like this. You should never treat a lady like this, even if she irritated the hell out of you. Bobby would have liked to have walked home with Judy, but it was more than his life was worth. If Chris found out what he was doing... His life would not be worth living. Bobby watched Judy from the upstairs bedroom window. His heart sank like a large coin being tossed into a deep body of water. It tore at his heartstrings to see the defeated, heartbroken figure of Judy, wearing her jeans and pink windbreaker, slink away into the dark shadows. He watched her disappear down the driveway until finally she was gone. Go after her! A little voice whispered in his ear, Go after her, Bobby! Bobby, go after her! But he refused to listen to that voice, to avoid any cantankerous altercations with his brother. Years later, he would always regret his cowardice, for had he gone after Judy Bengali, she might never have gone missing. He could hear his brother mumbling under his breath, What a bitch! It serves her right! I won't be treated like a mug! He could hear his brother thundering around downstairs, like a truculent rhinoceros, throwing his fists into the furniture. He was in quite the rage. After about five to ten minutes had slipped by, it would seem that the heat of Chris's rage had simmered down to a significant degree. He had grown a conscience all of a sudden. Bobby sighed with relief when he heard the front door slam behind his brother and the engine of Chris's car starting up. Thank God his brother was finally going after Judy. He'd do the right thing by her and chivalrously take her safely home, even if he did so rather begrudgingly. Bobby calmed down significantly, feeling moderately reassured that Judy would be safe. He loathed the thought of her walking home, down that long, dark, lonely country lane. A while later his brother returned home in his car. Chris could hear the car killing its engine and the sounds of a car door being slammed rather violently, followed by the front door. Chris could certainly wake up the living dead if he wanted to. His brother knew not the meaning of the word quiet, and tonight in his frenzied mood he seemed to enjoy creating pandemonium. Bobby heard him cursing under his breath. What a bloody cow! Honestly, I can't believe how she's treated me! He kept saying, and I'm supposed to forgive that, am I? I'm supposed to forgive that? Then he heard his brother in the upstairs bathroom, throwing up violently. Later on he heard his brother driving off again in his car, and returning home again, making equally as much commotion, 
as crashing thunderous sounds caused the floorboards in Bobby's own bedroom to wobble, rattle and quake, as if the double-story house had been subjected to a miniature tornado. A while later, Chris could be heard thundering up the stairs, as if his combat boots were made of cement. He could hear his brother say, It's not my bloody fault! What the hell am I supposed to do? What the hell am I supposed to do? What was his brother up to? Bobby was too tired to care. His brother continued to mumble, but his words became ambiguously vague, as Bobby closed his eyes and pulled the duvet cover over his head and floated off into a peaceful slumber. He woke up with a violent start when he heard the sound of gravel being crunched outside the door and could see the flash of a car headlights reflected over his bedroom walls. His first thoughts were his parents had driven back from Seattle in the early hours of the morning. This would not be the first time they had attempted a journey like this. He glanced at his watch. It was ten past two in the morning. He heard a car door being slammed, and the sound of angry combat boots treading over pebbles, and then the front door being pounded rather violently by a pair of powerful fists that demanded to be heard. Whoever was on the other side of the door, it would seem they were far from pleased. He discreetly crept over to the window and pulled it up, peering outside at the courtyard. He could see the belligerent face of Mr. Bengali, who, on seeing the window had been pulled up, glanced up at Bobby, his nostrils flaring, his face purple with indignation. "'Where is your brother?' he snarled, like a capricious bull terrier. "'Where is your brother? I need to see him now!' Before Bobby could answer the affronted man, the front door was discreetly swung open by Chris with a sizable squeak. "'Hello, Mr. Bengali. Anything wrong?' his brother asked gingerly. Chris was standing in the doorway, wearing a dressing gown over his pinstripe pyjamas. His hair was tousled, his eyes heavy with the burden of sleep. He seemed bewildered to see Mr. Bengali at the front door, at this insane, ungodly hour of the morning, demanding to know the whereabouts of his beloved daughter. "'Where is Judy?' came Mr. Bengali's thunderous voice that boomed through the night like a heavy drum. "'Where is Judy?' Chris sounded surprised. He trembled and then said tentatively, "'She went home about a couple of hours ago. I thought she was with you. Let's get this right. You're telling me you dropped my daughter off at our home. Well, how do you explain that she's not there, Chris? We've searched everywhere for her. We are frantic. My wife is beside herself with worry. She's phoning up everyone we know to establish our daughter's whereabouts. But you dropped her off at our house.' So why is she not there? I never said I dropped her off at home, Mr. Bengali, said Chris obsequiously. I'm afraid. I'm not proud of it, but we had an argument. She walked home on her own. You let my daughter walk home in the middle of the night on her own? Are you insane? What kind of a man are you? Said Mr. Bengali, grabbing Chris by the scruff of the collar. What have you done to my daughter? What have you done to her? If anything has happened to her, I will hold you responsible. I told you, Mr. Bengali, we had an argument, said Chris stammering. She walked home. You let my daughter walk home in the middle of the night. What were you thinking? I will hold you responsible, young man. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? What happened next was a little bit of a blur for Bobby. But at one point he remembered trotting downstairs and looking at his brother, whose face had grown as white as a sheet. He looked green at the gills, as if he wanted to throw up violently. "'What have you done?' Chris, he whispered to his brother. "'What have you done to Judy? I heard you driving off after Judy. Then you returned home. You got violently sick, and then you drove off again.' For a moment there was a stiff, airy silence in the room, as Chris turned around to look at his brother. "'I did go after her, but she wasn't there.' It freaked me out. I couldn't find her anywhere. I knew she couldn't have got home in time. So when I got back home, I threw up. Then I went out after her again, looking for her. It occurred to me that maybe someone gave her a lift home. You cannot tell anyone that I threw up, Bobby. Do you understand? It'll make people think I'm guilty. You're my brother. We don't snitch on each other. Do you understand? Blood is thicker than water. Bobby nodded in agreement. 
He knew that even if his brother was responsible for the disappearance of Judy Bengali, he'd never breathe a word of his suspicions to the police. He had never liked his brother much, but one thing he knew about family, they stuck together through thick and thin, no matter what. That's what families did. For years after the disappearance of Judy Bengali, Bobby would wonder if his brother had surreptitiously killed his girlfriend that night. He had never seen his brother so angry. Was he capable of murdering his girlfriend in a jealous rage? The thought made Bobby shudder in disgust. Before long, rumours abounded over the seaside town. Some people thought Russ Edwards had something to do with Judy's disappearance. Others believed Chris Hilton was behind her vanishing, while others speculated that she may have been abducted or even committed suicide after her argument with her boyfriend that had given her so much distress that she had decided to end her life. Judy's body was never recovered, but it could be buried in the forest or washed away by the ocean. No one knew what had happened to her. Life had never been the same for Bobby's family. Now they were living under the formidable shadow of Judy's disappearance and had received an abundance of hate mail from people who believed Chris was responsible for her disappearance. The post box was flooded with threats. I know you did it! You're a monster! May you rot in hell! The police found no resolution to the Judy Bengali case and no charges were ever laid. Bobby's parents decided to send their oldest son Chris to live in Greece so that any rumours circulating around the town about him would finally die down. Bobby's father Marco was originally from Greece and so it seemed a good idea for Chris to go and live with his father's brother and help him with his olive oil business which was thriving. As much of the oil was being imported all over the world and was doing a booming trade. Twelve years later, Bobby was feeling nervous about seeing his brother Chris for the first time in twelve years. Where had the time got to? It seemed to have slipped through his fingers like butter. All these years later, he was still haunted by the memories of his brother's ex-girlfriend, Judy Bengali, and what had become of her. For a long time, her missing persons posters were hung around the small town, on every tree and every lamp post, inviting people not to forget the 18-year-old teenager. But soon the fast-moving hands of time eroded her memory, and blustering winds blew the scattered remnants of those posters away, so that the faint ambiguous memory of Judy Bengali had become like a fading blur on people's minds. But for Bobby, her poignant, indelible memory was as raw and as real as if it had happened only yesterday. By all accounts, there were no eyewitness reports of Judy being seen on that night, walking alone on that sequestered, lonely road that at night in those days welcomed very little traffic, if at all. As Bobby got older, he persuaded himself that his brother had nothing to do with Judy's disappearance. Yes, he was negligent for not taking Judy Bengali back home safely to her parents' house in the throes of an argument. It would have been the chivalrous, decent thing for him to do. And Chris had failed to behave like a gentleman that night. He couldn't bear to think that Chris might have harmed the young lady and buried her remains somewhere so ambiguously obscure that her bones would never ever be recovered. Looking back, he knew his brother had a temper on him, but was he capable of getting so irate that he'd lashed out so hard that night and inadvertently killed Judy? He remembered a time when he thought his brother was going to break his skull apart. His brother had been appalled that Bobby would ever believe he was capable of really hurting him. As Bobby waited in the arrivals hall very patiently with his mother at his side to meet his estranged brother Chris, he barely recognised the young man walking boldly across the sprawling white tiles and opening glass doors of the arrivals hall with a huge grin on his face and standing loyally by his side was an attractive young lady with bouncy brown hair, olive skin and brown cheerful eyes, and the biggest shock of all was that the woman was heavily pregnant. Chris ebulliently rushed forward to greet them, leaving the mysterious woman at the trolley smiling at them shyly. Mrs Hilton flung her arms around her beloved son and hugged him so tightly to her chest. It was like she didn't want to ever let him go again. Chris turned around to hug Bobby. His expression was so warm, Bobby was literally taken aback. It's good to see you, Squirt. 
I've missed you a whole lot. I barely recognise you anymore. You filled out so much. His approving eyes swept over his brother. Well, I've been lifting weights, said Bobby modestly. I've always been way too skinny. You know I have. I decided I needed to fill out a little. I knocked back a few litres of milk every week to fill up. But the scales never shifted, so I turned to lifting weights instead and doing some boxing. And then I saw some substantial changes. Well, you look great, Squirt, said Chris. We've got lots of catching up to do. There's so much to tell you all. You talk about Bobby changing, Chris. But the same can be applied to you, my darling. I barely recognised you when you walked through the arrivals hall. I thought, who is that strange man waving at me? I got the shock of my life when I realised it was actually you. You've grown up so much. I'm beginning to feel suddenly quite old, said Mrs Hilton, chuckling, as she stood back to admire her older son, as if observing a great work of art. Chris, you were always a looker, weren't you? But you've grown into quite a handsome, debonair young man. You look startlingly like my father. And he broke many a woman's heart, let me tell you. It was true. If Chris Hilton had been a heartthrob at school, he'd only grown better looking in the last twelve years, if that were at all possible. It seemed the Greek sunshine and all that olive oil had done wonders for his appearance. Chris's skin was a nut-brown colour with a golden hue. It made his silvery green eyes stand out all the more. Oh, ma'am, I want to introduce you both to Natalia, said Chris, taking Natalia's hand and bringing her towards his mother. Mum, meet my fiancé. We have a baby on the way. You're going to be a grandmother. Mrs Hilton's face broke out into a huge smile. Oh, dear me, I don't know what to say. This day is getting better by the minute. She rushed towards the rather bashful-looking young lady, throwing her arms around Natalia. Hello, Natalia! Oh, my word, it is so good to meet you! She cried out. Welcome to the family! She looked at Chris, and her eyes twinkled. Why did you not tell me I'm going to be a grandmother? And why did you not breathe a word about your engagement? You are dreadfully naughty. You've got a lot of explaining to do. There's plenty of time for that, Mum. Besides, I wanted it to be a surprise for you and Dad, to find out you were going to be grandparents. I also wanted you to meet Natalia for yourself firsthand. Talking about her is not the same, you know. A surprise, Chris! Honestly, you are the end! I feel like a parrot that's been knocked off its perch in its gilded cage. But I am so thrilled with your news. I can hardly believe I'm going to be a grandmother. Your father is going to be delighted. I feel older every second. Where did the years get to? Only the other day I was pushing you in a push pram along the beach and watching you and your brother building sand castles and collecting shells. And now, now I'm about to be a grandmother. Oh, Mum, said Chris, kissing her tenderly on the cheeks. You're so dreadfully sentimental. Before long, the Hilton family were gathered together happily around the table. The living room had been set to entertain royalty, as Mrs Hilton had gone to so much trouble, on Chris's account, to make everything in their home perfect for the return of the prodigal son. The table was lavishly bedecked with her finest china and her best silver. There was a huge floral bouquet in the centre of the table, and floating balloons with the words, Welcome home, Chris. Bobby watched as his mother strutted around like a mother hen, crooning over her little chickens. Bobby could not keep his eyes off his brother. He had matured significantly, and his face was radiant with happiness. Bobby's parents were thrilled to see their son again, and his father looked as if he was bursting with pride to have his older son back at home. Bobby could see his brother was clearly in love with Natalia, and over delicious plates of pad thai and sticky spare ribs, the family talked happily while the hours melted away, like butter on a hot muffin. Every eye was inquisitively focused on Chris, as he talked garrulously about his wonderful life in Greece, growing olive trees and picking the highest quality olives that were then transformed into the finest olive oil.
that was exported to all parts of the globe. He told his parents how he'd met Natalia. She came over to the farm one day. She was working for her father's restaurant and was looking for speciality olive oil to use in their cooking and to sell to their customers in the delicatessen section of the restaurant. I agreed to meet up with her and give her a sample of our oils. I mean, we've got many varieties. When she came to our door and said, I'm looking for Chris, my heart, well, it did a double leap, let me tell you. The moment I set eyes on Natalia, I knew she was the one, said Chris proudly. I took her around the olive groves, and then we tasted all the olive oil together. She told me she liked my accent, and asked me where I was from. We sat there watching the sunset over the groves of olives. I invited her to join the family for dinner. I kept asking her around to try and sample this olive oil and that. And then, well, the rest is history. I proposed to Natalia under a tree in the grove, where a beautiful table had been set and a delicious spread laid out. It was so romantic, said Natalia, chuckling, lifting up her finger to show everyone her diamond engagement ring. They then proceeded to talk about Natalia's pregnancy. At first I thought that I'd been struck, you know, with a bad uh, food poisoning, she said. I was uh, violently sick. Then we discovered uh, we were pregnant, she said with a huge beam across her face. There was such a celebration back at the family restaurant. If my family had my way, we'd have, you know, hundreds of kids. Believe me, young lady, if you want my advice... You don't want to have more than two children. Look at this grey hair of mine. Can you see it? That's what my children did to me. Sorry, kids, but it's true. Overnight it was. No, said Mr Hilton, shaking his head fiercely. Fifteen, Natalia. That's far too many. Natalia began to laugh. In Greece, we like to have, you know, big family said Natalia, grinning. But you're right, Mr. Hilton. Fifteen, no. It's too many. I told my father, no way. But I think four. Four would be nice. We will compromise. Sounds like a very good idea, Natalia. Do you know what sex my grandbaby is? asked Mr. Hilton excitedly. We don't know the sex, said Natalia, meeting Chris's eyes. We want it to be, you know, a surprise. I think it much nicer not to know. But, you know, I have a sneaking suspicion that I'm expecting a boy. The thing has been kicking in my stomach as if it's playing football. Oh, dear, oh, dear, said Mrs. Hilton. I must tell you, Natalia, that Chris was like that in my belly. Mind you, Bobby over here, I was convinced he was a girl. I didn't get many kicks from him. Are you nervous about the inquest into the disappearance of Judy Bengali? asked Bobby, his eyes fixing on his brother. Chris seemed relieved to be broaching the subject, as if the uncomfortable elephant in the room was finally being addressed. After all, this was the reason he had returned to North America, to attend the inquest. Do you know what, Bobby? he said, putting his knife and fork down. I know there are a lot of people out there that think me or Russ have something to do with Judy's vanishing, which was why Dad sent me to live in Greece, to escape all those rumours and the wild speculation, and it was the best decision ever. I really enjoyed working with the Olives, and if I hadn't gone over to Greece, I'd never have met lovely Natalia, he said, reaching out to grab his fiancée's hand. Some things are just meant to be. Natalia's eyes met Chris's, and there were silent words of love spoken between the two of them, and Bobby found himself hoping that one day he'd meet someone who loved him as much as Natalia obviously loved his brother. Do you know what, Bobby? he said, putting his knife and fork down stoically. I know there are a lot of people out there that think me or Russ have something to do with Judy's vanishing. Which was why Dad sent me to live in Greece, to escape the nasty rumours 
the wild speculation floating all around town. It certainly was the best decision ever. I thoroughly enjoyed working with the Olives, and with Dad's brother, who's an amazing man. If I hadn't got over there, I'd never have met Natalia, he said, reaching out to grab his fiancée's hands very fondly. Some things are just meant to be, aren't they? Natalia's eyes met Chris's, and there were silent words of love spoken between the two of them, and Bobby found himself hoping that one day he'd meet someone who loved him as much as Natalia obviously loved his brother. I have to say, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hilton, I'm so lucky to have met your wonderful son, Chris. I know he would never harm a fly. He's got the kindest heart. Always rules the day he never took Judy home. It's very unlike him not to do that. Well, you always get the nasty gossips, don't you? said Mrs. Hilton. They believe the very worst in people. I know Mrs. Bengali, for example, hasn't spoken to me for years, ever since the dreadful ordeal when Judy vanished. I suppose I can't blame her, really. The family's been glaring at me for years in the church. They've also been giving Russ's family ominous looks. They're convinced one of our family's kids is responsible for Judy's disappearance. But I know that Chris would never have harmed a hair on her head. He really loved Judy a lot, you know. Things can happen. It's part of life. It is so desperately tragic that this happened. I so wish one could turn back the hands of time, but one can't. It certainly turned our lives upside down. We've never ever been the same again. For us, it's as if Judy only disappeared yesterday. That's how conspicuously fresh it's still in our minds. We will never forget the girl. Well, the Bengalis are not wrong, Mum, said Chris soberly. I am responsible for what happened to Judy, even if it is indirect. I never should have let that girl walk home that night on her own. What was I thinking? When I went after her in my car, I realised how dreadful I had been to refuse her a lift. And when I travelled down that road and I didn't see her, I knew instinctively that something bad had happened to her. She couldn't have got home that quickly on her own. I went back to look for her again, you know, but she was gone. I do remember coming home at one point and vomiting in the toilet, and going to bed that night thinking, please God, may she have got home safely, may someone have given her a lift. But deep down in my gut, I had my doubts that she'd got home at all. Something felt off. When I got out of my car that night and looked around for Judy, calling out her name, something in my gut felt really off. Really, said Mrs. Hilton. You do surprise me. You never told me this before. Because, ma'am, it was just a feeling. An intuitive nudging or impression, if you like that told me something wasn't right. The police don't want to hear about feelings. They want facts. But on that night, something was off. I could feel it in my bones. I genuinely felt afraid. Oh dear, oh dear, said Mrs Hilton. The more I hear about the Bengali case, the worse it becomes. I will be so glad when this inquest is finally behind us and we can move on with our lives. It's certainly been long enough. Natalia reached out to squeeze her fiancé's hand. I'm glad, you know, I agree with you, uh, Miss Hilton. I am glad the inquest is finally here. I know on the outside your son looks great. But believe me, the disappearance of Judy has been eating him up for years. He still has nightmares, you know, over what happened to her. Sometimes he wakes up in a cold sweat. The problem was, I was bloody jealous, very insecure at the time, said Chris, raising a brow. I felt as if that girl had punched me in the guts. The thought of her cheating on me with Russ Edwards, of all people, well, it did my head in, and I was so angry that night. I don't remember being more angry than that. 
I let her walk home on her own because I was furious, completely enraged with her. When I went after her twice in one night, she'd vanished off the face of the earth. I don't blame people for doubting me. To be honest, in their shoes, I'd probably feel the same. But I'm not kidding when I say something was wrong that night. And whatever happened to Judy, it was swift. I'm sure of it. Bobby had been surprised and somewhat confounded to hear his brother Chris nonchalantly talking about being insecure. He thought his self-assured, confident brother had it all. But maybe his brother's cockiness all those years ago was just a bravado. As Bobby listened to his brother's earnestness, he began to doubt that Chris had anything to do with Judy's disappearance. He was now more certain than ever. He seemed so sincere. If he wasn't responsible for her vanishing, then who was? Bobby tried to think about Russ Edwards. Could he have been the one who had something to hide? The young man had made no secret of his infatuation towards Judy Bengali. Could he have by chance run into her on the road, offered to give her a lift home, and when she told him yet again she wasn't interested in him, had he taken her rejection so terribly badly that he had killed her and clandestinely hidden her body? Bobby had heard that Russ had beaten up a local boy so badly after claiming the man had vandalised his car and deliberately scratched the words murderer on his bonnet. The young man had ended up hospitalised. Was it possible that Russ Edwards had harmed Judy Bengali when his temper had got the better of him? Bobby wondered how he would react in the same circumstances if someone dared to scratch out murderer on the bonnet of his car. For years, having people suspiciously doubting your integrity had to eat away at you like a worm in an apple and make you as mad as hell, especially if you were completely innocent. As if Chris was reading his brother's very thoughts, he said, You know what, Squirt? Even if we never know what actually happened to Judy, at least the inquest will bring things to a close. We can put things behind us. I've been dreading the inquest for years. But the sooner it's over with, the better. Natalia and Mum are right about that. I just don't like that can of worms being opened up all over again, said Bobby's father gingerly, wiping the crumbs away from his mouth with a napkin. Me and your mother, we nearly moved away from here all those years ago, because all the scandal in town was getting the better of us. But thanks to the town sheriff and his persuasions, People believed, Chris, that you had nothing to do with Judy's disappearance. People tend to listen to the sheriff. That man is a wise and old soul. He stuck his neck out for you over the years, you know. We got lots of support from the townsfolk after that, when all the speculations were being whirled around like candy floss about what had happened to Judy. It was tough going for us, and of course for the Edwards family. I also felt very sorry for them. Thankfully, over the years, the rumours and speculation and chatter has died down, when other stories tend to grab people's attention. People haven't talked about the Bengali case for years. People these days only have fond memories of you, Chris. They always ask after you, and when you're coming home. I don't know, said Mrs Hilton reflectively. Sometimes at an inquest, when the wound is open again, other witnesses can come forward, you know. Sometimes answers can be found. I do feel so much empathy for the Bengali family. I can't imagine what it's like not knowing what became of their daughter. The not knowing is a killer, you know. I can't imagine how I would feel. If any one of you were to go missing, I'm not sure I'd have pulled through like Mrs. Bengali has. That woman has been like a Trojan horse, given everything considered. I don't like to say this, Mum, said Chris reflectively, but I think we can all establish that something bad must have happened to Judy that night. I do not believe for a moment she's in life any more. I know she'd never have committed suicide, nor would she have run away to start a brand new life. I think she met with some foul play, unless she had a fortuitous accident, and if that is the case, her body was never recovered. For a brief moment, there was a lugubrious melancholia around the dinner table, 
and nobody said a word. Finally, Mrs Hilton broke the silence. It's so tragic. She was such a lovely girl, wasn't she? I do remember how sweet she was. I don't know how this could have happened to her. I just wish we could finally have some closure to this case. It's haunted me for so many years. But just so you know, Chris, me and your father have never doubted you for a moment. And as you know, the town sheriff has never doubted your innocence either. Not even for a second. That's what he told me. He said that to you, asked Chris, looking surprised. Oh, yes, he did. He was singing your praises. He says it was an unfortunate set of circumstances, the Judy Bengali case. But he'd bet his life on it that you had nothing to do with her disappearance. He said once on a Boy Scout trip with you and a group of boys, one of the scouts nearly fell over the edge of the cliff, and you didn't hesitate to pull the young man back to safety, even though it put you in perilous danger, because it was incredibly slippery. He said you didn't spare any thought for your own safety, but risked life and limb to save the young man. You were a hero that day, and nobody forgot that either. Everybody was in awe of your bravery, because without your intervention, that young man would almost certainly have died. He was holding on to a tree root, but the branch was very flimsy, and he was running out of strength. Everyone stood back in horror, watching, knowing that even if they called for help, it would be far too late for the young man. But you intervened at the risk of your own life. And the sheriff said what you did was heroic and nothing short of it. No one else had the courage to do what you did. Oh, that, said Chris, that was no big deal. But it was, sweetheart, and the sheriff said it shows what kind of a character you have. I know the sheriff has always believed my account, said Chris, but it is nice he's persuaded the townsfolk of my innocence. He's a good man. He was only speaking the truth, my love, said Mrs Hilton, lovingly reaching out to squeeze her son's hand. It's all going to be all right at the inquest. You wait and see, she said, giving him an encouraging wink. The inquest. Bobby was amazed to hear about how his own brother had saved a boy scout from falling over a cliff. He'd never heard about the story before. His brother had never blown his own trumpet about the event. But clandestinely brushed it under the carpet. But it was something to brag about. For not many people would likely be willing to lose their footing and go tumbling down the cliff to meet their imminent demise. It cemented Bobby's belief that maybe over all these years he had completely misunderstood his brother. Maybe his brother's belittling of him when he was younger was some kind of an affectionate humiliation, if you can call it that. Not that he saw it like that at the time, of course. Obstensively, his mother had tirelessly told him over the years, Chris loves the bones of you, Bobby. You've got him all wrong. He just loves teasing you and winding you up because of your reactions. If you didn't react in the way you did, which is always hilarious, he probably wouldn't pick on you so much. You were sitting duck for his abuse. Bobby had hated living under his brother's shadow. He admitted to himself he had always been jealous of Chris. His brother had been a popular kid at school, great at sports, teachers had lavishly poured praises on him, and his academic prowess. He had been one of those people that was good at everything, and offered scholarships left, right and centre, as if they were growing under his armpits. And furthermore, his brother had annoyingly drawn girls to him, like fireflies to a bright lamp. Bobby had bashfully never had the same bedazzling effect on girls. He was not exciting enough, that was for sure. Then there was the quintessential fact that he had secretly nurtured a crush towards his brother's girlfriend, Judy Bengali, at the time. He knew it was wrong to hanker after your brother's girlfriend, but he couldn't help himself. He, like Russ Edwards, thought a woman with red hair was like a goddess, but this was a secret he had wisely kept to himself at the time. After Judy's fortuitous disappearance, he'd always doubted his brother, but maybe a small part of him wanted to believe the worst in him as some kind of macabre payback for being the butt of his brother's jokes. For a moment Bobby felt self-disgust and loathing that he could have ever doubted his brother, 
Yes, Chris had a bad temper on him, that was for sure. But so did lots and lots of other people. But it didn't mean they set out to murder people in the heat of the moment. Most people who thought their girlfriend was cheating on them were entitled to be angry. It was a natural human reaction. Even if Chris's reactions had been disproportionately over the top and rather dramatic, Despite everything, Chris had never been predisposed to violence, and on the occasion when Bobby thought his brother was going to kill him, his brother on the cusp of his indignance had withdrawn from their heated altercation. Chris had genuinely been shocked that his brother thought he was going to harm him. "'My God! You really thought I was going to hurt you!' he had said, looking so disappointed in Bobby, as if he couldn't believe his brother could get him so wrong." Bobby wondered if once when this was over, the two estranged brothers could finally become friends again. But he did long to know what had become of poor Judy Bengali. He knew if his brother Chris had dated Judy, and then the relationship had ended, he'd have likely long since forgotten his brother's girlfriend. But because of this case hanging over them, like a bad smell, having never been closed, it had continually haunted his life and the lives of his parents who had never been allowed to forget the young 18-year-old girl. At breakfast on the morning of the inquest, no one ate much, for the mood was sombre and bleak in the Hilton household. You could have touched the tension with a knife. Glasses of orange juice were abandoned in favour of mugs of coffee. Everyone was craving a caffeine hit to get through the day that lay ahead of them. By the looks of things, no one had enjoyed a peaceful night's sleep the night before. "'Isn't anyone going to eat?' Mrs Hilton had complained. "'We shouldn't go to the inquest on empty stomach, should we?' "'We can't eat,' Mr Hilton's voice had boomed. "'I'm sorry, sweetheart. I know you meant well.' "'I think we should be making tracks,' he said begrudgingly. "'We need to get to the courthouse, and we need to get this day over and done with.' The Hilton family filed into the large minibus together, like steers being led to the slaughter. Mr. Hilton drove to the inquest. His hands remained on the steering wheel, but they were so tight you could see the whites of his knuckles showing obtrusively through his skin. He tried to steady and calm his nerves by focusing intently on the traffic. Mrs. Hilton had dressed in a black dress with a white belt. She believed wearing anything colourful would be dishonourable, and she didn't want to draw attention to herself. She could imagine the headlines in the local paper. "'Mother of son, who was one of the suspects in the Judy Bengali case, "'causes a stir when she arrives at the inquest, "'in brightly coloured clothes, strutting down the courthouse like a peacock.' "'During the drive to the courthouse, which was rather harrowing, "'no one uttered a word, for there was nothing to say. "'Bobby could see his brother Chris was apprehensive this morning, "'as you would naturally expect. "'Indeed, the family was all feeling rather flustered.' and dreading the next four laborious days that lay ahead of them, like a lingering bad smell that would not abate no matter what you did to eliminate it. Chris looked rather debonair this morning, more handsome than ever. He was wearing a smart navy blue pinstripe suit that looked as if it had been made to measure by an exclusive tailor's, and a pale blue cotton shirt, complemented by a rather swanky navy and white tie, as well as a pair of black Oxford shoes, that were so shiny you could see your reflection on the leather. Chris persuaded Natalia to stay behind at the house. She seemed heartily relieved not to be coming to the inquest, and who could blame her? I don't want the inquest to upset you, he told her lovingly, because it might affect our baby. Good luck, she had whispered to Chris, throwing her arms around him and giving him a tender kiss on the cheek. Everything is going to be all right, I promise you. Don't you worry about anything. This time next week, it'll all be over, and we can put this horrible business behind us once and for all. We have so much to look forward to in the future. Remember that. As the Hilton family neared the courthouse, Bobby could feel the tug of his heart as it began to flutter violently in his chest. His hands were wet and clammy. He bit his lips nervously. Surprised to see he'd actually drawn blood. His father fastidiously looked for a parking spot outside the courthouse. A female radio presenter, in her dulcet tones, 
began to discuss the inquest. New theories emerge at the inquest today regarding the disappearance of Judy Bengali, who vanished after a fight with her boyfriend Chris Hilton twelve long years ago, when she walked home alone on a lonely sequestered country road in the small unassuming seaside town, never to be seen or heard again. So what did happen to Judy Bengali? She began to list the key witnesses, the evidence to be reconsidered, the roll call of witnesses. Right, I've had enough of that, said Mr Hilton, thumping the steering wheel in agitation and hurriedly switching off the radio. He parked the minivan and with a vacillating hesitancy, the van door rolled open and the Hilton family steadily climbed out, greeted to the cool flush of the May air. The Hilton family marched towards the entrance of the courthouse that was busily flanked by the crush of photographers that were deliberately blocking their path. Bobby drew in a deep breath, straightening his back stiffly and grimacing inwardly, wishing with all his heart that this hungry school of piranhas, with their flashing cameras directed towards Chris, would go away. He walked past the sea of treacherous cameramen, reporters and journalists, his eyes fixed on a point beyond him. Chris, cried out one of the reporters, how are you feeling about the inquest today? Are you nervous about giving your statement in court? Did you kill Judy Bengali? came another confrontational voice. What happened twelve years ago? Have you got anything to hide? Chris's face remained stoic and expressionless, giving nothing away as he stared at the middle distance. Soon they entered the court foyer and were wrapped in the civility of the law. Everything became significantly calmer, and after their bags were checked by security, they finally entered the court. The Hilton family are met cordially by their lawyer, Norris Boxwell. He greets them warmly and ushers them down a long, sweeping corridor until they enter the courtroom, where the Hilton family are rudely confronted by the very people they dread seeing, all inauspiciously gathered together in the same place. Bobby's eyes travel over the Bengali family, only a few yards away, clustered around some officials. Bobby is visibly shocked by how thin and drawn Mrs. Bengali looks. Her eyes are like sunken hollows, but they're also puffy and swollen, as if she's been crying for years. Her frail body looks as fragile as a porcelain doll, as if she might just easily break. Her once red hair has turned as white as snow, long before its due time. Judy's two younger sisters stand protectively on either side of their parents. They're both now in their twenties, with similar strawberry blonde hair that Judy had and blue eyes. One of the sisters looks almost like a double ganger for Judy. For a moment Bobby forces in a deep breath, as their likeness to Judy is uncanny. It sends shivers of dread down his spine. He doesn't need to be reminded of her. He has had more than enough reminders of Judy to last an entire lifetime. He doesn't need more. Mr. Bengali's face is tight, his calculating eyes hard and cold, but his expression remains carefully guarded. He's holding his wife's hand tightly, giving it an encouraging squeeze from time to time, as if to say, We'll get through this. The court doors open, and a middle-aged woman, the state coroner, bows her head briefly before the court. A tall, wiry man with a receding hairline and a thick pair of glasses addresses the coroner, with his back facing away from the family. Your Honour, we're here today. The hope is to determine whether Judy Elizabeth Bengali is now deceased, and if this is the case, the possible circumstances of her death. During these proceedings, we will be considering the following, which may or may not explain her absence. Judy might have willingly chosen to disappear, have chosen to live elsewhere. She might have chosen to leave and be hidden by others. She might have set off on an adventure and died a natural death, such as a stroke or a pulmonary embolism, a heart attack. And her body was subsequently never recovered. She could have had an accidental death from a fall. Judy may have intentionally ended her life or her fortuitous untimely death may have been caused by another and been concealed like a motor accident. Finally, we need to consider whether Judy died 
from the hands of another. The coroner nods. She adjusts her thick-rimmed tortoiseshell glasses on her face. She then directs her attention to all in the courtroom. I do understand that this is a very distressing time for family and friends of Judy Bengali. I ask everyone during these proceedings to conduct yourself in a civilised manner, restraining yourself from any improper conduct. The coroner sends sympathetic glances towards Judy Bengali's family. Her dark, kind eyes hovering over Mrs. Bengali for a second longer than most people in the courtroom. Introductions are then made. It would seem different lawyers represent the Hiltons, the Bengalis, the Edwards and the police. Finally, the retired town sheriff is asked to approach the stand. He walks purposely towards the front of the room, his eyes holding the Bengali family for a brief moment. Bobby had noticed that over twelve years, the sheriff has become even more streamlined and muscular. The years can be seen on the crepey telltale lands around his brown eyes and the receding grey hair on his head. Bobby thinks the sheriff looks rather distinguished and polished, and it seems that the ravages of age have rather become him. After the sheriff has taken the oath on the Bible, promising to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God, he's asked to give his formal statement to the court. He discusses the search party that had been orchestrated for Judy Bengali after she fortuitously disappeared twelve years prior. We were first called over to the Bengali residence at about 8 a.m. on Sunday the 8th of April, 1983. The sheriff's gaze travels through the courtroom, settling on the occasional person he is probably acquainted with. Then his eyes skim briefly over Chris Hilton, and there is empathy in that look. He returns his steely gaze directly back to his notes. He shuffles through them rather awkwardly, continuing to address the court, returning to his key notes. Judy Bengali was 18 years old. She had no curfews given her age. The Bengalis were used to her coming home rather late, but at two o'clock in the evening, that was too late a time for Judy. Mr. Bengali woke up to find his daughter's bedroom was ajar, and given she always closed her bedroom door at night when she retired to bed, he discreetly checked up on his daughter to see if she had returned home. But her bed had not been slept in. Mr. Bengali knew at once that something was horribly wrong. Judy should have been at home. She was a reliable, very prompt young lady. The family made some urgent phone calls in the middle of the night. Mr. Bengali went to search for Judy himself, visiting the houses of Chris Hilton, Russ Edwards, and Judy's best friend, Alice Corsico. We were to learn that Chris Hilton had allowed Judy to walk home alone after they had a fight together. His brother, Bobby Hilton, was witness to the heated exchange between Judy and his brother. This was the last time anyone saw Judy alive. It was after a great deal of searching. The family then called the sheriff's office to alert us that the 18-year-old, much-loved member of our community was missing. Once the alarms were sounded, search parties were organised, sniffer dogs were used, and the public was alerted to her disappearance. But Judy Bengali never returned home that night and was subsequently never seen again. As the events of the court rolled on, some discussions became technical and hellishly boring, droning on laboriously like a dripping tap. Questions were answered. The sheriff was cross-examined at one stage by the Bengali lawyer, Mr. Isaac Truman, claiming that the sheriff could have done more to search for the teenager, which was not true in Bobby's opinion. Then it was Chris's turn to come to the stand. The court became stoically silent, as all curious eyes were focused directly on Chris. Although Bobby thought he looked remarkably composed, his hands began twitching nervously, and the bristling Mr. Bengali was glowering at him viciously, almost as if he had just confessed to murdering his daughter. Soon Chris's eloquent voice filled the courtroom, and no one even fiddled with a pencil or coughed in court, as all eyes remained focused on him 
possibly watching for any signs in his body language that might betray a guilty conscience. The last time I saw my girlfriend, Judy, alive, was outside our front door. A friend of mine called Simon had been in the public library earlier on in the day. He told me he had seen Russ Edwards whispering in Judy's ear, and later that day she was seen with him on the swings at the park, near the beach promenade and the Trevelli ice cream shop, getting very cosy together. I confronted my girlfriend about this. She assured me nothing was going on between the two of them. She was adamant about this fact. The trouble is, I failed to believe her. She told me Russ was funny, but she would never be interested in him, and she was just nice to people by nature, but it didn't mean that she fancied them. I guess I was jealous and very insecure. I was only eighteen at the time. People thought I was very full of myself, but I had my insecurities and self-doubts just like any other person. I'm only human after all. At the time, I genuinely loved Judy Bengeli. I believed she was the right girl for me. I could not imagine losing her to another guy. The idea filled me with dread. I knew Russ had had a crush on Judy for a long time. It was well known in town. It seemed that Judy rather enjoyed his attentions, and that annoyed the hell out of me. I was livid with her. I didn't believe her claims that all her flirting with Russ Edwards was completely innocent. Call me paranoid if you like. Maybe I was. I thought she was making a fool out of me. It offended my ego. I'm not proud of myself or the way I behaved. I told her to get lost. She asked me to give her a lift home or at least to let her phone her father so that he could pick her up. I refused her, I'm ashamed to say. I was so enraged with her. I told her to walk home alone and that I was adverse to giving hookers lifts. She was very upset with me. I was furious. She told me she was scared to walk home alone at such a late hour of night, which is understandable, of course. She reminded me that by foot the walk would have taken her 25 minutes. I'm afraid I called her some dreadful names that I'm not proud of and I don't frankly care to repeat to this courtroom. I did have no sympathy for her plight. Indeed, I was quite pleased that she was stuck between a rock and a hard place, and was forced to walk home all on her own. I did say she could sleep in our greyhound Sophie's kennel, that she sometimes slept in during the summer, the dog, I mean. That did not go down well with Judy. My parents were in Seattle at the time, seeing friends and had taken Sophie along with them. My mother was very fond of that dog at the time. I'm afraid I let Judy walk home alone, which was a dreadful decision that I would live to regret. After a while I came to my senses, realising that as furious as I was, I could not expect my girlfriend to walk 25 minutes to her home in the dead of night on her own like that. My father had not brought me up to be so unchivalrous. He always told me to treat a woman like a lady, no matter how aggrieved I was with her. I knew if something bad happened to her, that I would never forgive myself. I reluctantly got in my car and drove along the route Judy would have taken, but she was nowhere to be seen. It freaked me out, of course it did. I knew she couldn't have got home in such a short space of time, unless someone had given her a lift. I returned home with a profound sense of prognostication. In hindsight, I should have contacted the Bengali straight away and shared with them my misgivings. But I drove out again down the same route, looking for her. I persuaded myself that maybe someone she knew had given her a lift home. But my guts were recoiling, as I think deep down I sensed something was distinctly off. It was at about 2.30 in the morning that Mr. Bengeli arrived at our front door, asking me where his daughter was. He was naturally very aggrieved with me. Actually, he was furious for having not lifted his daughter home and asked me what kind of a man I thought I was. Of course, I have never been able to forgive myself for my insouciance, but I would like to inform the court 
that I had nothing to do with the disappearance of Judy Bengali. I did not cause her any bodily harm, and if I had done so, I would have confessed to that and served my time in prison. I am not a violent person by nature, but I do have a temper like I did on that night. But I am always in control of my temper. Obstensively, I could not live with inflicting pain to the Bengali family, for they have the absolute right to know what happened to their daughter. There were a few mumblings that rambled through the courtroom after Chris's statement. The coroner interjects. She raises up her arm. Please, will you be quiet? All of a sudden, the retired town sheriff enters the room. He's wearing a grave expression on his flustered face that has turned as red as a field of poppies. He hurriedly steps forward towards the coroner. His powerful demeanour looks quite shaken, like a tree that has been hit by a tornado. Your Honour, says the sheriff, please may I approach the bench? The coroner frowns. Yes, she says, sounding moderately irritated. If you must, but this better be good. The sheriff nods. You need to hear this, Your Honour. It will change the trajectory of this case. Something significant has just come up. Mumbles abound around the courtroom as people whisper among themselves. Please be quiet, says the coroner. Bobby's gaze remains fixed on the coroner. His fingers tremble. His heart flounces around his chest like that of a startled pigeon. What could have happened, he wonders. He knows, as does everybody else in the courtroom, that is holding their breath, that something quite significant has just transpired. After all these years, there is a bewildering sense that answers to an old cold case are on the precipice of being birthed. Mr. Bengali is sitting on the edge of his seat, his back as erect as a pencil, his sharp eyes widening every second, as he focuses steadily on the coroner. Bobby can only imagine what is going through his mind. The lawyers all hurry towards the coroner, and soon they're held up in earnest conversations. There is much head-bobbing. Finally the lawyers all nod in agreement, and then scurry back to their seats. For a moment there is not a whisper or a sound to be heard in the entire courtroom, as everything grows airily quiet. The coroner addresses the court, her steely eyes focusing on the Bengali family and then she throws out a bombshell in the courtroom that leaves everyone gasping. It has come to my attention that there is new evidence, and in this light the court is now adjourned, until further notice, she says slamming the desk with her wooden baton. When the Hilton family leave the court that day, they barely notice the obtrusive microphones being thrust into their faces as the reporters cry out, what is this new revelation from the court? Has the body of Judy Bengali been found? People wave their arms up at the reporters, saying they don't know what's going on. And the retired sheriff speaks to the cameras that are hungry for information. In the light of new evidence, the court has been adjourned. That is all we're saying at the current moment. There is no further comment to be made. The Hiltons return to their car bemused and no one says a word on their journey back home, but all are thinking the same. What new evidence has come to light? Two months later. Bobby sat there waiting in the visitor's room at the prison to meet the prison inmate Terence Oliver, who had informed the police where the body of Judy Bengali could be found, and when her bones were recovered, everyone was at long last able to breathe a huge sigh of relief, for finally both Chris Hilton and Russ Edwards, who had lived under a dark cloud of suspicion for far too long, were now in the clear, and even the Bengalis had reached out to the Hiltons to apologise for doubting their son. "'I'm so sorry,' Mrs. Bengali had said to Chris when she'd phoned him up in person, her heart heavy with regret. She sounded like she was crying down the telephone. "'I should never have doubted you, Chris. I was so quick to lay the blame at your door.' I'm so dreadfully sorry. I feel so ashamed. I was such a fool. My daughter Judy thought the world of you. She'd tell me she was sure you were the one for her, and that you had a heart of gold. I thought she'd got you so terribly wrong, and that you were some kind of insidious psychopath. But I now know I was so dreadfully wrong. 
The sheriff has been telling us for years that you had nothing to do with the crime. He kept saying to me, Mrs. Bengali, that young man would not harm a fly, even though he does have a temper on him. But I wouldn't listen. I guess I was looking for someone to blame. Mrs. Bengali, that's perfectly understandable. Don't apologize to me, said Chris obsequiously. I am the one that should be apologizing to you. I still hold myself accountable for letting your daughter walk home alone that night. I will never be able to forgive myself for that. You're right, it was inopportune timing. If the circumstances had been different, Judy might have arrived home safely. But I was negligent in not taking better care of your daughter. I did go after her, but I was too late. I will always regret that. We've all done things we regret, Chris. I'm just so upset that the monster Warwick was killed in prison by other inmates there. Why did they have to bloody kill him? He'll never be held accountable for what he's done to my daughter. I wish I could go and see him and give him a piece of my mind for daring to hurt Judy in the way he did. The man, the man was a monster. Mrs. Bengali, do you know... I agree with you wholeheartedly. But I don't think that man got away with what he did. I'm sure at the end of the day, there is some kind of divine justice that will be served to him. Oh, I hope you're right, Chris. I really do. I don't want you to ever blame yourself for what happened. Teenagers always have disputes. I did when I had boyfriends, when I was a young lady. It was all just bad luck, a question of my daughter being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I cannot believe she accepted a lift from that thug. What was she thinking? I've always taught my children not to accept lifts from strangers, and then my daughter goes against all my sagacious advice. It was a very dark night, Mrs. Bengali, Chris reminded her. It would have been very intimidating to walk home at night like that. Maybe Judy thought she could trust Warwick Kavenick. I mean, if you think about criminal monsters, they probably get away with what they've done because they're benign. It is possibly because they don't impose a threat that people tend to trust them. It's like a fly getting tangled up in a spider web. You never expect anything insidious is about to happen until it's too late. You're probably right, Chris. I just hope Judy didn't suffer. That's one thing that has always troubled me. Anyway, I'm so glad it's finally over, and we have some closure at long last. It was so dreadful not knowing what happened to poor Judy. I now feel I can move forward with my life, and I hope you can do the same, Chris. You're a young man with your whole life ahead of you. I understand you're getting married to a lovely lady from Greece who's just had a baby boy. So congratulations are in order. I wish you both all the happiness in the entire world. You need to move forward, Chris. We all do. We cannot allow that monster to take anything more from our lives than he already has. You're right, Mrs. Bengali. We need to put this behind us, but we will never ever forget Judy. And what she meant to us all. She was a very special person. That she was, Chris, said Mrs. Bengali wistfully. Bobby did not know why he'd come to the prison to see Terence Oliver, whom had surprisingly agreed to see Bobby. He knew in his gut that he had requested this visit for his own peace of mind, and for closure to the Judy Bengali case, that had haunted the remainder of his teenage years. No one in his immediate family knew he was meeting up with Terence Oliver. This was the man who was the one that informed the press where the body of Judy Bengeli could be found. True to his word, after a map had been drawn up, Judy's body was located under a very distinctive tree with a split trunk and another tree growing through the split. The tree looked like two conjoined hunchback old men. Bobby had not come to the prison for anybody else except himself. He was still so haunted by this horrifying case. He was certain there was so much more to the story than met the eye. He wanted to know everything that had happened to Judy, 
on that lonely cool Saturday night in April twelve years prior, and was seeking some kind of personal closure. He knew he needed to meet the prisoner, who'd shared a cell with Warwick, to gleam some insight into the case. Now he was having some vacillating reservations about whether meeting up with this man was a good idea after all. He had no idea what Terence Oliver was incarcerated for, but maybe the less he knew about it the better. The main thing was the man had agreed to see him, which was a promising start. Bobby glanced around the square visitor's room, rather nervously. It was incredibly grim. Two armed policemen stood on either side of the room, their eyes almost like stone marbles as they stared towards the mid-centre, with fearsome expressions on their faces. Both men were burly, rather reminding Bobby of Rottweilers on guard duty, that would pounce at once if anything went awry. There was a clock on the further side wall, counting the minutes. The pokey tables and hard, uncongenial visitors' chairs were hardly friendly, but maybe that was the whole idea. Nothing about prison was supposed to be cosy. There were some visitors speaking to prisoners, but still there appeared to be no sign of Terence Oliver. Where was he? Had he changed his mind about speaking to Bobby? Then there he was, a flash of orange being brought over to his table by a police guard, his legs shackled. "'You're Bobby Hilton?' he asked. Bobby nodded, and the prisoner sat down opposite him. Bobby stared at him curiously. He looked relatively non-threatening a slender man in his fifties with grey hair and brown ferret-like eyes that stared at Bobby inquisitively. He looked like a regular man you might see when walking your dog in the park. Thank you for agreeing to see me about this case. I do appreciate it very much. I only agreed to see you because you are the brother of Chris Hilton, the man who was under suspicion for the disappearance of Judy Bengali. He has my sympathy. I do hate it when people get falsely charged for something they did not do. Why did you speak out about this case? asked Bobby gingerly. It was when I heard about the inquest, said Terence sorrowfully. I thought about that poor mother, having no closure for years and years in being able to bury her daughter. I imagined what she'd been through all this time. When I saw her distraught expression in the newspaper... "'along with the picture of Judy Bengali, "'I knew I needed to speak out. "'I have a mother myself. "'I can't imagine what that would have done to her. "'Of course I wouldn't have spoken out "'if my cellmate was still alive. "'I'd have an obligation of loyalty to him. "'There can be a code of ethics in prison "'that you don't like to breach. "'Warwick got stabbed over a minor dispute in prison, "'so now he's gone.' "'So I'm free to discuss the case,' he said nonchalantly. "'I swore to Warwick I'd never tell anyone his secret. "'But I guess I'm entitled to talk about it now that he's dead, "'although the police aren't giving me any plea deals. "'But I'm OK with that. It is what it is. "'So what made Warwick tell you about Judy?' "'Terence scratched his head reflectively. "'Well, you know.' We shared a lot together back then. The two of us were stuck in a cell together. And when you're with your cellmate 24-7, you get talking about everything, including secrets and regrets, of course. He asked me if I'd ever killed anyone before. I said, of course not. I've defrauded people, done bad things in my life. Of course I have, but I would never kill anyone. "'What do you take me for?' I told him. "'I'm no monster.' "'I could see a troubled look on his face. "'And I said, "'Why have you killed anyone?' "'He looked at me incredulously "'and pretty much jumped down my throat "'and said, "'What do you take me for? "'Of course I haven't killed anyone. "'But if I got a chance to kill half these prison inmates, "'especially Dirk Potter, "'that man is a psychopath, "'I'd do it in a heartbeat.' After our fraught conversation, I did sense something was amiss, and that he had something on his mind, and I knew he was hiding something from me. One day I saw Warwick drawing a picture of a woman with strawberry blonde hair. He was a brilliant artist, you know. I will say that for him. The inmates would bring him photographs of loved ones, 
and asked them to draw pictures of them, in exchange for cigarettes and stuff like that. I thought him to be a halfway decent person, compared to some of the inmates here. Not everyone who's murdered is a monster, you know. And believe it or not, Warwick wasn't all bad. He had his good qualities, but he did have a temper on him that could get out of hand at times. I asked him who the picture of the girl was. I said she had beautiful hair and looked very feminine with her porcelain complexion. I thought it might be a lover of his, a girlfriend perhaps, or even a sister that he was pining after and missing desperately. He told me it was none of my bloody business, so I didn't intrude any further. He got very defensive and very brusque with me. I noticed he would look at the picture a lot and sigh. I figured out that this was a woman he had once loved, and for some reason or another his heart had been grievously broken by this person. I had no way of knowing he was nursing a dark clandestine secret, and that this was the picture of the woman he'd actually killed. One day he was lying in the bunk under mine. He asked me once again, Terence, have you ever killed anyone before? This was the second time he'd asked me the exactly the same question. I sat up in bed and said, I told you, I've never killed anyone. Why do you keep asking me this insane question? I've told you some of my less than pretty secrets. I've got nothing to hide, Warwick. I'm in prison for fraud. He said to me, Well, I've killed before. I remember lying there thinking, I can't believe he actually said that. He was pulling a fast one, surely he was. Granted, he did get himself embroiled in some cantankerous disputes and altercations in prison. He beat up a guy badly one day. The man was hospitalised for over three weeks. But I didn't think he'd have murdered anyone. He was in prison for embezzlement and stuff like that, but not grievous bodily harm. I didn't say anything as I lay back in my bed, soaking in what he'd said to me. I will admit I was shocked. I said only four words. Who did you kill? He told me, you know the picture of the girl with the strawberry blonde hair and the blue eyes? I killed her. When he told me that, I was confounded. It's one thing to kill a man after a pub brawl that goes badly awry. But to kill a woman? Well, that's very wrong. He told me he hadn't intended to kill her. He said he'd been driving down this lonely road in the middle of the night. He was visiting cousins of his, staying over at their place. He was suffering from insomnia. And when he did, he took himself for a drive. He loved driving at night. It calmed his nerves. Then he saw a young lady walking on her own. Even though her eyes were puffy and she looked distraught, he thought she was very beautiful. He'd always been partial to Titian colouring and fair skin. So he stopped his car and asked the girl if she needed a lift. He said she looked scared to be walking in the dark and reluctantly agreed to accept his lift. He said she had a good sense of humour. She said, I'm not supposed to accept lift from strangers. You're not the axe murderer, are you? He laughed and said, Do I look like an axe murderer? She stood back and looked at him and said, I suppose I can trust you, but if my mum had an inkling I was accepting a lift from a stranger, she'd murder me quite literally. She climbed into the seat next to him and said it was kind of him to give her a lift. She was in a right state, she sure was. He could see she'd been crying and offered her some tissues so that she could blow her nose. He told her that whatever she was upset about, it couldn't be that bad. It wasn't the end of the world. She was crying and saying she was afraid that her boyfriend was going to dump her because he thought she was cheating with someone else. I don't want to lose him, she said, but I'm pretty sure it's over between us. He made me walk home tonight, all on my own. Can you believe that? Can you believe he would do that? He'd never normally do that to me. He's usually such a gentleman. But tonight, 
Tonight he was so angry. I've never seen him like that before. Some guy phoned him up to tell him I was flirting with a guy called Russ. And of course, Chris believed all the lies. Whoever they were, they're such a snitch. I like Russ. He's a nice boy. He makes me laugh, but that's it. But of course, Chris won't believe a word of it. Warwick told her that her boyfriend was a loser, making her walk home all on her own. He told her she deserved so much better. Besides, her boyfriend was still very young and immature. She'd be so much better off with an older man who was more, you know, together. And he said that he could make her feel a lot better. He told her that they could go back to his place and have a nice drink together and talk. Nothing more. She said that they could go for a drive and just talk, but she didn't want to go to his house. He told her he knew of a pretty place where they could have a nice chat. Soon he parked his car near Marlow Hollow and sat in the car smoking cigarettes with her. Judy told him all about her boyfriend and how jealous he was. I think he's insecure, you know. I mean, the girls all fancy him at school because he's a hottie. But underneath the layers, he's actually got not much confidence, you know. He's always threatened about me going off with someone else. I wish he'd trust me more, but he doesn't. It drives me nuts. Warwick had some vodka in the car. They both took a few swigs. She told him, Take me home, please. It's getting late. My parents will start worrying. He said they were in a very beautiful location on a quiet road, surrounded by lots and lots of lofty trees. He leant over to kiss her, telling her that she was very beautiful, and she got very upset. She hurriedly opened the car door and got out, telling him, Leave me alone! What's wrong with you? I told you I've got a boyfriend! I just wanted to talk, that's all! I thought you understood! Well, Warwick got very angry. I don't know why she had been confiding in me, he said. I thought she liked me. I was obviously getting all the wrong signals. This was what he said to me, in his own words. I was attracted to her, and I grabbed her, and I was trying to kiss her. She began to run in the woods, so I chased after her. It was very dark in the woods. I almost gave up following her. But through some moonlight trickling through the trees, I saw her ambiguously slipping away. I think I almost became like a predatory lion in pursuit of its kill. I knew I wanted her. It was impossible to stop myself. My desire was insatiable, and her vulnerability made her even more irresistible in my eyes. I've never wanted a woman more as much as I wanted her. I grabbed her rather fiercely, I have to admit, pinning her down onto the ground beneath me. She was slapping me, wriggling, scratching me, and the next thing I knew I just lost my temper. I had my hands over her neck, and I was squeezing and squeezing. I was so angry with her rejection of me. I was shouting obscenities at her like, You bitch! Why are you such a tease? It all happened so quickly. I don't know what came over me. I never knew I was capable of murder. But I killed her so easily with my bare hands. And when I let go of her and realised she was dead, I was confounded. I couldn't believe what I'd done. I was actually very shocked and startled. It had been so easy to kill, scarily so. I then heard this monstrous roar. Something came charging towards me. I've never been so frightened in all my bloody life. I was in the woods, and this black ponderous big shape came galloping towards me, snapping twigs, beating the ground so heavily with its powerful legs. Honestly, it sounded like a herd of galloping bison were literally thundering towards me. The ground heaved like the loose floorboards in a house. Would you bloody believe it? It was a big foot. This titanic, furiously enraged thing was snarling at me, 
nostrils flaring, jaws wide open, revealing its teeth. It was glaring at me with menacious yellow eyes. You have no idea how huge this thing was. He stood there yards away from me. I thought I was dead. That look in his eyes was, I want to kill you. I want to kill you. I felt cornered by this thing. It looked at me and then at the limp figure of the girl lying next to me. And would you believe it? I know you're not going to believe this, but he spoke to me. I know it sounds insane, but it's true. The strange language was translated into my head. The words were, What have you done? What have you done? Sakani! Sakani! Something like that. He ran over to the girl and picked her up, slapping her cheeks, trying to rouse her from her deceased state. I just stood there, watching, completely bemused. I was so terrified. I froze to the spot, my legs crumbling beneath me. This Bigfoot was so upset to see this girl dead. He began to beat his chest. He actually howled as if I'd killed his very best friend. He took it personally. I was astonished. I just stood there when he was telling me to get the hell out of there. I mean, this Herculean creature was disgruntled and less than amused. He knew I was responsible for killing this girl. He wanted to do the very same to me. I was sure of that. He looked enraged. His fiery eyes burnt into mine, and he growled like a rabid dog, virtually foaming at the mouth. I thought he was going to kill me. He gave me chase. I ran as fast as I possibly could. My legs felt like cement beneath me. But I managed to get to the car in time. The creature was shaking his fists, shrieking at me, following my car. When I heard all the news about them looking for Judy Bengali, I knew I had to go back to those woods to recover the body. I was absolutely certain that if they found her body, there'd be my DNA under her fingernails. I didn't want her to be discovered, and for me to be accused of the crime, because she had scratched me. I needed to get back to the woods and remove the body, bury it somewhere more discreet, where it'd be less likely to be found. I was worried I'd encounter that monstrous Bigfoot again. I was going to the woods at night so I wouldn't be seen, but this time I went armed with a rifle. So if I encountered that beast, I'd kill him at once. I knew looking for the girl's body during the day would not be a wise thing to do. There were too many people sniffing around at the time. I couldn't afford to take the risk, despite the fact it was a secluded area, further afield from where Judy went missing. But I wasn't prepared to take any chances. You can't be too careful. It was twelve o'clock at night when I arrived in the wooded area. It was a long way away from where the searches were being conducted for Judy. There I was with a torch and a rifle, slipping stealthily into the wood grove to recover her body. I had in mind that I was going to toss it into a large lake. I walked into the grove and found her grave. Not her body, her grave. I knew it was her grave, as it hadn't been there the day before. I discovered this huge burial mound covered with sticks and fresh wild flowers, and I knew at once the Bigfoot had buried her there. It was located under a very distinctive tree that I knew I would never forget. I became nervous when I realized I was being watched. I knew at once. It felt as if there were vindictive eyes everywhere spying on me, spitefully burning into the back of my neck, watching and waiting for me. Every hair on my arm was standing up erect. I've never felt fear like that. I heard whistles, wood knocks, owl hoots being exchanged like some kind of secret code being communicated in the trees and it was all about my presence in the woodgrove. I knew it was. 
I began to feel that my rifle would be pretty useless as a form of defence. Then there he was again, the Bigfoot, standing there, watching me. And it was worse than I could have imagined, because there were three of them, all equally as formidable and intimidating. They stood there in front of me, like a wall of steel. And in that moment, I knew I was dead. The monstrously big male Bigfoot grabbed my rifle, furiously snapping it in half, throwing it into the trees in disgust. His blazing eyes were on fire with indignation. They all shrieked at me, telling me to go away. They were furious that I had had the audacity to come back. They then chased me out of the woods, snorting behind me and screaming. The male Bigfoot grabbed my arm, snapped it in half, just like my rifle. And it was agonizingly painful. My arm was literally hanging off me like a rag doll. But I managed to get away. But that part of my memory is a blur, because it was so traumatic. I think I blotted it out. Those things wanted me dead. I think the female persuaded the big male not to kill me. I knew I'd never go back to that place again. But after seeing the burial mound, I was reasonably satisfied that Judy's body would never be found. Bobby stared at Terence Oliver, looking stupefied. He told you all that? I'm afraid so, said Terence. And you can be as cynical as you like about the story. But I believed every word that Warwick told me. When he started telling me about the Bigfoots, he was shaking like a leaf. He said those things scared the bejesus out of him. He said he'd rather have encountered a rampaging bull elephant than those things. They scared the hell out of him. He was certain they were going to kill him. And when he told me the story, he wept and wept like a baby. If you don't mind me asking, how were you able to tell the police where they'd find her body? Asked Bobby. Because while it told me the location, he even drew the tree, showing me exactly where it was buried. It looked like a conjoined hunchback, that tree. The police found it easy enough. Bobby walked away from the prison with one thought on his mind. My God, that was some story. It would seem while Terence had left out the details of the Bigfoots to the police, he had felt comfortable enough to share those details with Bobby. At least now he could put the dreadful case of Judy Bengali behind him and begin to live again, and knowing what happened rarely helped. So there we are. That's my story. Well, what can I say? Oh, nothing like a cold case, is there? I mean, goodness gracious me. And it seems like that man who harmed Judy Bengali, he certainly got his run for his money. He certainly got some divine justice in the end with those Bigfoots going after him. It's amazing that they didn't kill him after what he'd done to Judy. But anyway, what an extraordinary story. Well, hello there. I hope you enjoyed the Omnibus edition. We've got many more coming our, our way for you to listen to. Sending you love wherever you are in the world, in North America, Canada, Kenya, wherever you may be, I send you lots and lots of love. Thank you for listening to my Omnibus and I really do hope you enjoyed it because that's the whole idea about it is to give you some interesting stories to listen to. So until next time, goodbye and good night.